Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Sego ani buju wachea kwe kwe. As the mayor of the city of Kingston, I offer these words in the spirit of this gathering. Let us bring our good minds and hearts together as one to honor and celebrate these traditional lands as the gathering place of the original peoples and their ancestors who were entrusted to care for Mother Earth since time immemorial. It is with deep humility that we acknowledge and offer our gratitude for their contributions to this community, having respect for all as we share this space now and walk side by side into the future. So we were just meeting in a Committee of the Whole closed meeting. We discussed a couple of items, the downtown parking supply and a lease agreement uh, at 53 Young Street. So I will ask for a motion to rise without reporting, please. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that Council rise from the Committee of the Whole closed meeting without reporting. Please vote. And that carries. Uh, next, we have the approval of the added. We just have the uh, one additional report from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee, and then an item of communications. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Osanek. Please vote. And that carries. Are there any disclosures of potential pecuniary interest? Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you very much. I have two, in fact. The first one is I, Councillor Neal, declare a possible pecuniary interest in Clause 4, Paragraph 4, and 10, specifically with respect to the approval of the Kingston Community Hospital Foundation 2017 budgeted transfer, as I have a family member who is an employee of KGH. And my second one is I, Jim Neal, of the Council of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of information report number four on rental licensing, as I have family members who have rental properties. Okay, thank you, Councillor McLaren. Thank you, I, Jeff McLaren of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of info report number four on the advice of the Integrity Commissioner owing to the fact that I am a landlord. Thank you. Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, I, Ryan Bohm of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number 18-012 and 18-006. In regards to report 18-012 as an employee of Utilities Kingston, I have an indirect interest in this matter. I declare an interest in report 18-006 insofar as it relates to Utilities Kingston. I would like to ask that report 18-006 be separated so I may vote on the portions that are not in regards to the utilities. And also, I, Ryan Bohm of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of Clause 1, 2, 3, and Para 4 of Report Number 8. As an employee of Utilities Kingston, it may be perceived that I have potential pecuniary interest in this matter. Clauses 1, 2, 3, and 4, Para 10, and Associated Bylaws. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Your Worship. I, Rob Hutchison of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number eight, the third note. Um, to declare pecuniary interest with respect to clause four, paragraphs two and 10, specifically with respect to the Housing and Social Services Department, housing programs, social housing <coughs> subsidy, as my employer, Kingston Cooperative Homes, Inc., participates in the City of Kingston's affordable housing program and the associated bylaw. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Candon. Thank you, and through you, I, Adam Candon of the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of uh, motion number one, as I am a licensed realtor and owner of a real estate brokerage. 
I, Adam Candon, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report uh, inf information report number four, as I am a landlord. I, Adam Candon, the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of report number eight. As my spouse is employed at home based housing. Also, as I missed uh, last meeting, I would also like to declare uh, pecuniary interest in close, closed item A from December 5th, 2017. Thank you. Councillor Osterhoff. I, Gary Osterhoff, of the Council of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of uh, information report number four on the advice of the Integrity Commissioner uh, owing to the fact that I am also a landlord. Thank you, Councillor George. Thank you, Worship. I, Kevin George, at the Council of the Corporation of the City of Kingston, declare my pecuniary interest in the matter of information. Report number four is I also own rental properties in the City of Kingston. So there's three of you left. <laughs> okay. Seeing no other. Uh... Okay, so we have a couple of additional declarations, so I'll just look for any other hands. Councillor Candon. Thank you, through you. Just as a point of uh, uh, clarity, my conflicts uh, related to my spouse are also uh, tied into the operating capital budget and any bylaws uh, related to those. Deputy Mayor Neal. Now I was asked to add that provision as well and any accompanying bylaw for my declarations. Okay, thank you. Any other declarations? Okay, so with that, we will we will move on. So uh, we have no present uh, we have no presentations this evening, but we do have several delegations. So first, uh, we'll invite Joanne Robin uh, to appear before council and speak to new motion number one uh, with respect to the Central Kingston Growth and Infill Strategy, Redendale. And again, just a reminder to all of our delegations that you have five minutes. Mayor and members of council, thank you for the opportunity of speaking to you this evening. My name is Joanne Robin, and I live at One Crescent Drive in Redendale. My purpose in speaking with you tonight is to appeal to Council to consider the feasibility of either appending Redendale in the Central City Growth and Infill Strategy, or developing a separate study specifically for Redendale. The neighborhood group that I'm speaking on behalf of and who has signed the petition to council presented last two weeks ago and completed a survey are requesting action due to what we perceive as excessive development pressure in our neighborhood. For example, right now on one single street in Redendale, Kirar Boulevard, with only 47 houses in total, Current redevelopment on only four properties is for nine new houses and six severances possibly proposed. 
almost a 20% changeover in one year. Under current regulations, this pressure, which continues to increase and accelerate, unfortunately has the potential for very real negative impact on adjacent properties. We have documented cases and significant unregulated impact on the overall built form of the neighborhood. Please be assured that we are not against development. We appreciate the positive impacts that new housing represents and the necessity and desirability of investment in local properties. What we have difficulty with is exactly what we understand the Central City Growth and Infill Strategy is addressing for Central City neighborhoods. To quote, to ensure that new development in these areas is context appropriate and compatible with the physical character of the established residential development. To prepare area specific guidelines to address the built form of future residential development and to entrench those guidelines in official plan policy and zoning framework that can be defended if necessary at the local and provincial level. Redendale subdivision was developed in the 40s and 50s as veterans properties when all the lots were double and severances were expected to follow in time. Over the years, most of the lots have been severed and infilled, but the oldest homes are now ripe for redevelopment due to increasing property values and the desirable features of the neighborhood. Although the architectural style varies considerably and lacks consistency, it has always generally respectful of the overall built form of the neighborhood. Large treed lots, generous preservation of spacing between homes, consistent setbacks, and large rear yards where balconies, add-ons, and second story windows were not designed to overlook neighbors' private areas. Today, new home builders are not potential home owners. They are developers, applying not only to sever, but to double sever properties, and build homes that are far less respectful of their immediate neighbors and the general built form. We have found that adjacent properties are suffering damage during construction and water infiltration post-construction. When new homes are constructed with deep, elevated basements, disproportionate lot coverage, and almost clear-cutting construction practices. As a group, we have been looking at infill problems in our neighborhood for at least two years. 30 seconds. At Committee of Adjustment in April 2017, we contested and won against a variance application to erect three large homes on a lot already severed prior to 2010 and therefore not subject to current regulations, restricting severances to no more than three per lot and also not subject to any site plan control. However, we lost at the OMB. So Our main concern, last sentence? Last sentence. Our main concern is to find support through responsible city planning procedures that will respect the existing character of our neighborhood while allowing for context sensitive development. And of course, we would like it sooner rather than later. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any questions from council? Councillor yes. Turner. Turner. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, presentation. Can you tell me about some of the other concerns you're facing in your neighborhood, traffic? Um, some of the problems are construction related to traffic because when infill housing is occurring, there are lots of trucks, uh, pickup trucks that are on small roads. We have small roads, we have no sidewalks, we have ditches. And we get a lot of trucks parking just around one home while construction is going on. Um, there is some increased traffic, of course, from new homes, which instead of 
what we used to have, which was no garage or well, at most one garage, they now have at least two cars, maybe even three. And for one lot where you used to have one, maybe two cars, you can get easily four cars for one home. So there is an increase. Um, I think that's, you know, traffic wise, that's what I would point to. During construction time, it's very dirty. Some people are commenting that they feel that they're living in the construction zone, lots of mud. And it's, I think the biggest worry would be maybe for children who are walking to school in the area. We have a neighborhood school, we're lucky with that. And uh, with no sidewalks, it, it can be an issue. Thank you. Councilor Stroud. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. And thank you for your presentation. Um, I'd like, you, if you know maybe the history of the Redendale and the age of the homes, um, sort of how does it fit in contextually with the city? Obviously, it's, in, it's on the other side of the Cataraqui River. Just wondering if you know when the uh, neighborhood was first built and uh, if the homes are all the same age and if they're, they're similar in that sense. No, I'd say they're, um, like we were first built in the 40s and 50s. So we've got, you know, almost 70 year old homes. All right. Uh, luckily, we were a good neighborhood and almost, almost every home has been well maintained. All right. So there's, there's no, it's, they're well maintained homes. Um, they're small, you know. Then, because they were all double lots, they become severed and infilled. I would say there's, there was probably considerable infill in the 70s and then maybe in the 90s. So, we are, a lot of them are infilled, but still some of those early homes that were very small, almost cottage like, were put smack in the middle of a, what we call a double lot today. So when those homes are turning over, we have a double lot, people look at the size and they want to just take down that almost old cottage and the tendency for a developer is to apply for two severances on that one lot. So take down one home, build three, it's pretty lucrative for the individual. Also, it's a particular problem I find on corner lots because corner lots have, you know, a small home and then a large sort of backyard and they front on two different roads. So when those homes go down, they're almost always supplied to put two homes on that lot. Neither of them ends up with any, um, any backyard or any backyard to speak of, certainly, in relation to other properties. And um, uh, the other aspect of that is, uh, I can't remember. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's okay. the corner lots are, are always an issue with regard to redevelopment, I find. Thank you, that's very illuminating. I had another question about your survey, so. Uh, someone else is presenting the survey. Oh, okay, okay, I'll keep my question for later then. Thank you very much. Thank you, are there any other questions? Okay, seeing none, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we'll move on to our next delegation. James Stewart will appear before council and again speak to new motion number one uh, with respect to Reddendale. Uh, Mr. Mayor, councillors, thank you very much for your time and attention this evening. Um, what I'll try to do is give you some concrete examples of what Joanne talked about. So we've had... Uh, recent development in Redendale, and she's talked about how the new homes are incompatible with the existing properties and they're out of character of the neighborhood. It's a wonderful little neighborhood with uh, generous lots and modest homes. Uh, besides being out of character, these new homes actually cause water problems. So when a new home goes in, a lot of trees go down, and the trees are good temporary reservoirs during storms. Uh, a lot of green space becomes concrete or house, um, and the basements actually uh, divert underground water flow, of which there's a lot. And so we've experienced lots of flooding recently. Uh, the rate of incompatible development is accelerating. As Joanne talked about, we have uh, a, a, one of the streets has many, many new homes on it, or many, many properties with potential new homes on it. And we've been uh, organizing for several years to, to oppose this. And so what we're hoping is that the council will give us tools 
uh, with which we can preserve the character of our neighborhood. So I'll talk about two things, flooding and character, okay? So here's a, here's a street, um, and you see in the foreground the uh, sidewalk, which has been flooded. Uh, in the background on the left, the house has three feet of water in its basement, and Gord is paddling uh, in the middle of the street. So uh, on another view, this is another area, you see lots of water over the, over, the, over the road. This is water that sump discharged from the house on the right there. So the house had so much water in its basement that it flooded the road and the uh, lawns that were downstream of it. Uh, so flooding's a big issue with new development. Um, so to give you an idea of the character of the homes, uh, this is one home, one of the original homes, and it was developed recently, and the same home taken from the same, sorry, from the same viewpoint is this now. And so what happens typically is the developer will build up the earth and then build up the first floor and then put two floors on top of that. And this thing, which is, although it's a two-story home, overpowers, it overshadows all the two-story homes around it. So it's completely incompatible with the neighborhood. Here you can see one house on the left, which is the new one, one house on the right, which is the old one beside it. Here's a new house, you can tell which one it is. And there's a little old house on the left, on the right, sorry. So you can show pictures like this, but you can also uh, quantize this. You can actually show data that shows how the character of the neighborhood is changing. And so we looked at a bunch of houses in, around a particular intersection, and we looked at the size of the lots and the mass of the house on the lots. And so each blue dot here is a house, and as you go off to the right, you get larger lots. And as you go upward, you get more massive houses. And so the vertical axis is what's the floor space index, which is essentially the square footage of the house over the square footage of the lot. And so massive houses appear high there. And so what's, what the, what's the worst thing is to have a massive house that's on a small lot, okay? So um, there's A, which is a small house on a big lot. There's B, which is the median house. So statistically, this is the representative house of the neighborhood, okay? Uh, there's C, which is a large, a large house on a moderately small lot, and there's, there's another house, that's D. Okay? So in 2006, this characterized the neighborhood. Okay? So this is really what the neighborhood looks like. Okay? It gives you the lot sizes and the densities. And so one very large lot was subdivided into two in 2006 with reasonable houses. Uh, in 2014, a very small house on a big lot was subdivided into reasonable houses. But more recently, and we're getting lots uh, which are being subdivided into very small lots with very dense houses. Okay? And the orange dot on the right side there is this house that you've already seen. The orange dot on the left side is this house beside it, which is on the smallest possible lot, and it extends to the extremes that are permitted by the setbacks. And in fact, the developer applied for a variance here and went outside the setbacks. Okay? Um, and very recently, we fought against uh, this house being uh, split into three lots. Uh, we won at the Committee of Adjustment, but lost terribly at the OMB. Uh, the house that's the middle red dot uh, has been built, and the other two houses we expect to be built soon. 30 seconds. Thank you. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, we're experiencing significant adverse development. The form of the new houses is completely incompatible, and it's destroying the character of the neighborhood, which we love very much. Uh, the new development is causing increased flooding. Citizens are opposed, and we've been opposed and agitated and organized for quite a while now, and we're asking that the Council provide us with some tools with which we can fight this adverse development. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? Councillor Osanek. Thank you, Your Worship. And they say that a photo is worth a thousand words. Those were great photos. They really, you know, proved the point. Um, for the flooding on the street there, I know that was this past summer, right? Was that um, a big rainstorm yeah. or was that just the shoreline being so high that caused all that water? No, we've experienced increasing storms, of course. And so we're experiencing increasing flooding be because of that. But the infill and the new basements are exacerbating the problem. As, and that's a particular example of the exacerbation. Okay. Any other questions? Councillor Trimmer? Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit about how the topography is changing and the drainage and how the other houses are putting in more sump pumps? You were telling me something about that earlier. Yeah, so the new house on the corner of my, my street 
has been put in, and it, it, it's one of these large houses with raised basement and very tall. Um, and it has a sump pump out the side, which is running every five minutes as of tonight, okay, when there's been little rain. And so there's a lot of underground water flow in the neighborhood. This is on limestone. There, there's an overburden of about six feet, and then there's limestone. And so water comes down from the prison lands and floats over the water across like that. And when a new basement comes in, it, it diverts the water into the neighboring properties. And so you get a lot of people with sumps that just aren't able to handle the flood. Um, okay. Thank you. Okay. That's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. Okay. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, our third delegation this evening, Jason Hurd, owner of DocuPet Inc. and Grant Goodwin, chief executive officer of DocuPet, will appear before council to speak to information report number five, DocuPet update. Thank you, your worship. Thank you, councillors. Happy holidays to all. We're getting there. Uh, today, I just want to talk a lot, little bit about pet licensing generally, but also about um, our program here in Kingston. Uh, in Canada, there are a lot of pets. If you uh, care to do the math, take the population of any area, divide by two, and you're getting pretty close. Just about every municipality in uh, Canada chooses to have uh, pets licensed as a mandatory bylaw. And uh, there's very good reason for it. Um, I've listed some here. Animal safety is a big one. Uh, public safety is a second one. Costs associated with animal control and reducing those costs is a third. And finding ways to recoup costs uh, and to drive new revenues is another prominent reason why all these municipalities do it. Um, and uh, the fact is that licensed pets get home. And that's one of the primary reasons we like to see pets licensed. Um, with our program, I'll expand on a little bit more uh, here, but uh, animals can be uh, easily identified not by uh, animal control officers only, but by other residents who are uh, as likely uh, as not to be animal friendly and want to see animals home safely uh, each night too. Um, lost and found pet tracking allows for uh, animals to be identified uh, and brought home uh, safely and in the city of Kingston to be brought home at no, ch at no cost. Uh, microchipping is not an effective way to get uh, pets home, not nearly as much as uh, direct identification that allow anyone to, uh, who interacts with the pet to get that pet home. Um, pound stays and euthanasia uh, is both burdensome and extremely expensive, and uh, uh, licensing uh, helps avoid those costs. Uh, and loose animals out in public are a risk uh, often both for the animal and for the public, uh, but certainly can be a nuisance for those who don't enjoy animals. Uh, Kingston's pet licensing program is doing fairly well. Nationally, uh, the average is 8 to 10% compliance. Uh, in Kingston, we've increased uh, uh, the compliance rate from 8 to 13% uh, to the most recent reporting date this last month. Uh, we've licensed uh, 7,066 pets with the uh, support and help of City of Kingston and a number of uh, other partners in town. Um, but uh, we're often asked why pet licensing compliance rates are so low. And uh, what we know is that there are four primary reasons for it. The first is that people simply don't know they need to license their pets. The second is that they see it as rather useless. What's in it for me? Why should I? Perhaps that's the uh, eye of a cat that stays inside all the time. Don't see any value in it. Um, it's an inconvenience. Many uh, communities, it's necessary to get to City Hall, park your car, get inside, and to do so during regular business hours. And oftentimes, there's no cost to not doing it. Um, our program is designed to uh, approach uh, the first three uh, in this list. So in the city of uh, Kingston, we have uh, awareness programs. Uh, yeah, I'm sure you've all heard of our door-to-door -door program, but we have other programs as well, as you'll see in the report. We make pet licensing valuable by providing rewards programs and offers and deals to those who choose to license their pets um, so that it's not uh, a cost burden, but in fact a financial advantage if you choose to license your pet. We get pets home. So far in the last two years in Kingston, 110 pets have been returned home safely as a result of our lost and, pound, uh, lost and found uh, uh, alert services. And we make it easy. We provide online, phone, mail, in-person licensing, which wasn't previously available, and auto renewals and a whole slew of other programs beyond it. 
The DocuPet program is designed to be a, a revenue increaser for the municipalities that we work with and to reduce costs associated with it, and our business model is designed as such. Um, we are a centralized business, and you see many business models like this. We are obviously Kingston-based, um, but we found ways of making uh, uh, complex systems um, that allow for pet licensing to be optimized uh, for municipalities. Uh, Kingston was our fourth partner uh, a couple of years ago. We are now in more than 21 Canadian municipalities, including the vast majority of the province of New Brunswick. Uh, we're in BC now, and uh, we're looking forward to announcing some pretty exciting stuff about our expansion south of the border soon. Um, we love Kingston. Uh, some of you have seen me and perhaps my associate here before. We work really hard for this town. Uh, we work really hard for innovation uh, in this town as well. Um, we're lucky. We're lucky because we have really amazing city staff here in, in, in Kingston. A couple I see here. I won't mention my name because they don't have to be on camera, but they're terrific 30, and that makes it easy. 30 seconds. Thank you. 30 seconds. Um, but we're also growing very quickly and we're adding a lot of jobs and it's really important that uh, innovative companies like ours can find the right people that we need. You can see we've added 15 people in the last six months alone and we have a lot more that we want to add. Um, we need Kingston to be um, uh, what we need it to be in order for us to grow quickly. Uh, and that means uh, it has to be our training ground for new hires and it has to be our talent pool where we can find the necessary and talented people who can help us scale at the pace we want to and outpace competitors Thank and get those pets home across North America. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, thank you. I have a couple of questions. Um, I know that there are two door hangers, if you will, that your company utilizes. That's right. One is a straightforward, uh, as, I, as I read it, just a simple, straightforward uh, information one informing people how they can uh, license their pet. Yeah. I think the problem that we saw both with telephone calls and with social media was that second one you used. Mm -hmm. Was it vetted at all by city staff? How did you come up with the wording that does seem a little aggressive? to some, some residents. Yeah, uh, I'll answer the best I can. I don't know, is there a time limit on answers? I'll well, just, not too long, I get it. Um, <laughs> careful, yeah. Uh, so first of all, we operate in many cities. We operate, operate that program in many cities. And so um, what we were required to do was to figure out what language works best. And so we do that by uh, trying different methods, uh, but also by trying different language, different colors. Um, and so we found that uh, through many, many iterative processes that this was the most effective method for, uh, for driving uh, increased compliance. Just a quick follow-up, if I can. I, I guess when I first read it, mm -hmm. I thought it was overly aggressive. And that seems to be a consensus among a lot of, of citizens. I know that it may drive up your success rate, mm -hmm. but I think it's, I, I don't think personally. So question, it, question. Yeah, it does, it does uh, your company question. credit. Is there any chance that, that you'll be able to reword that, perhaps with some input from our city communications people? Yeah, I mean, to my knowledge, communication was involved, not in crafting it, but approving it. And like anything that we do in this city, I can't stress it enough, the staff of this city are terrific to work with. And we work with them on all sorts of things. And I'm sure when we look to bring the program uh, forward again, we've had to suspend it due to some uh, uh, threatening language online toward our staff. Uh, uh, but I'm sure we've been talking with them about the language and a few other things too. So, yes. Councillor Sanek. Thank you, Your Worship, through you. Um, congratulations with the success with DocuPet and getting the number of licenses and dog tags, cat tags up so much in Kingston. That's great to hear. Um, for the, um, going back to the incident in November where it looked like some people were pretending to be representatives from DocuPet and going door to door, um, right now it's the dead of winter. Are 
DocuPet representatives still going to be going door to door in January, or are they taking a break now until spring? Yeah, great. Thank you for the the, the kind words, and um, I'll just point of clarity: we don't know what was happening. We heard uh, one complaint directly, and it was uh, about a male knocking on doors after 6:30. And obviously, we don't have male door door representatives and they're out in the early and they don't knock on doors. Um, we've heard other stories of people wearing lanyards and clipboards and our staff doesn't have lanyards. So we don't know what was happening, whether it was, uh, it certainly wasn't our staff. We know that. So thank you for allowing an opportunity to clarify that. Um, uh, in every other municipality where our door-to-door -door program is running, yes, they're going all the time. They're full-time jobs. Uh, we try to hire in the local areas uh, where we serve um, and uh, we try to use it as a um, training ground to find new talented people who can move up in their career too. So we try to find different diverse backgrounds, young and and uh, uh, different age groups and different ethnic backgrounds and we're exploring new ways of doing that here in this city too. Great, thank you. And my second question is to the uh, bullet point you had there where um, like residents have to believe in the benefits of registering their dog or cat. And some people think like, what's in it for me? I don't see any value in that. Definitely one value is the rewards program. Um, mm -hmm. It's been very successful in Calgary, for instance. Uh, they have Ikea and lots of different places in their rewards program. And what we learned a couple of years ago when we were looking into all this responsible pet ownership is that some people in Calgary were actually pretending they had a dog or a cat just to get the rewards discount card to you. So what's happening with the rewards program in Kingston? Well, it's a good question. And um, we're a small business and you do what you can. Uh, it's one of our more robust programs in Kingston relative to other cities. Uh, I, I wish I did know the exact number of deals and rewards we have. Um, it's, uh, it's holiday season. So in fact, right now we're offering, um, we're working with a couple of local uh, uh, pet shops um, and uh, one regional one. Um, to provide additional uh, incentives. So I think even right now, and correct me, uh, I'll, I'll, I might be a bit wrong on this, um, but uh, everyone who renews their pet by uh, the end of this year will receive a free $20 voucher um, and a number of other gifts and rewards. So we continually try to find those ways to do it. Um, it, it it's built on, uh, obviously, it, it can't be a, a dreadful thing if we can make it enjoyable, it works. But if we can uh, counter the issue of people feeling like, ugh, I'm losing money, I don't think it's valuable. But to your example in Calgary, I'm gonna go find a pet I can license. Um, you can obviously turn the, uh, the, uh, the dynamic around. So uh, it's something we always work on, it's sort of always on, but right now it so happens we're working pretty hard to make it even better in this particular city. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Turner. Okay, Councillor Bohm. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you, <clears throat> just uh, in regards to kind of some of the things that did come out, um, could you just quickly run us through, like, when a DocuPet employee would go up to a house, what would they actually do? I, like, mm -hmm. they're, they're not to be peering in windows, et cetera, et cetera. So, so what, what actually is happening? So it, it, it's, I think the best way to describe it is what does a mail delivery person do? Right, so they clearly mark pass, they walk up to the door. Um, I'll take a step back. First of all, they're given assigned routes. So there are certain homes or uh, residences that they are to visit, um, and uh, they track that uh, every, every day. Um, so they, they walk up the clearly defined path, and they go to the door and they hang the hanger. Um, there are only about three things that could happen that would lead them to believe that there is a pet at the home. Um, it could be, a, you know, you can, you've been to places, I'm sure, where the dog jumps up and goes nuts on the door, you know, just because someone's nearby. Um, those are obvious ones. Um, there's often a poop bag or, uh, you know, the dog dishes on the front uh, stoop, or there's a save my pet sticker, a sticker in case of fire. In those cases, they hang the other one because they're pretty darn sure. Um, of course, if someone's not sure, they can call us uh, and we can uh, have sorted out. But uh, and then they head on to the next home. So it's just home to home to home to home. Uh, it's just uh, in this case of the city, uh, both of the employees are, are uh, younger, female, and both worked at uh, Gananoque uh, Humane Society. So we try to find pet lovers uh, if we can. They enjoy the job more. Thanks. And then just a quick follow-up, and it kind of speaks to the, what's on the actual hangers. So I know you mentioned some of the benefits before, mm -hmm. but is there any thought to maybe adding that on the hangers itself? Like, why actually license your pet? Did you know last year 110 were returned to homes in Kingston? Like, have, has there been any thought to come Yeah, in fact, uh, I think we're running a pilot in another city where at every residence we're leaving an informational sheet as well. Okay. Um, and... Uh, 
uh, it turns out that that's uh, been very useful. So it's something we would explore doing here, of course, once we have a chance to talk more in the new year with uh, the staff. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one quick question. So you talk about how Kingston is your training ground. So would you say that the success that you have seen here in Kingston is helping to uh, to grow the business and and gain interest from other municipalities than in, in Canada and the U.S. So do you see that this is an opportunity for economic development here in the city? Well, uh, it's, it's it's as direct as I can get it for you know our, our small business, but it's you know it's growing. Um, you can imagine there's not a single municipality, um, they're risk adverse and wisely so, they should be. Um, they want to speak with the managers of our program and other municipalities. And of course the immediate extension of that would be, well, I'm sure you're in your own city. And so they want to speak to people at Kingston and we need to have results that are uh, mirroring or better than the rest of our program. And Kingston is one of our better performing uh, uh, programs. Um, our, our, our vision is to be uh, uh, the uh, largest pet licensing organization in North America. Um, there's, I mean, 450 jurisdictions in Ontario alone. Um, we're getting pretty good at what we do. I think the results in, in Kingston tell that. Um, with 21 cities, 15 employees have been uh, added in the last six months. Um, we could very easily be a significant employer in this uh, city uh, and we can do it with a whole range of different types of skill sets and um, just backgrounds of, of people too. It can be a really interesting employee mix that we can have with this business, um, but we need to grow and, and uh, Kingston's our home and we want to do that here and it's important that we um, uh, use this neighborhood as a way to uh, learn and build fans and to have some of those fans come and work with us. That's great. Thank you very much. Okay. Seeing no other questions. Thank you. So thank you, we'll, we'll move on. I'll just make a quick call if there are any other further delegations to add. Councillor Turner. Thank you, Your, uh, Your Worship. I would like to uh, add another delegation to this evening, uh, seconded by Councillor Neal or Deputy Mayor Neal. That council procedure bylaw section 11.5 be waived to allow Kyle Lake to speak to the new motion number one, Reddendale. Thank you. Okay, so that's moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal. So we will call the vote, please. Please vote. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. I, Council, uh, Deputy Mayor Neal, uh, move and Councillor Holland has seconded that Council Procedural Bylaw Section 11.5 be waived to allow Scott Carey to speak to information report number five regarding DocuPet. Okay, please vote. One more, please. And that carries. Any other delegations to add? Last call. Okay, so we will uh, now invite Kyle Lake to appear before council to speak to new motion number one with respect to Red Day. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, councillors, for allowing me to speak. I'll be speaking on the Reddendale Infill Housing Survey results. My name is Kyle Lake, and I have lived in Reddendale for over 35 years. The tool that was used is called SurveyMonkey, 
And despite its name, it's a standard tool for surveying uh, uh, online. Uh, based on two uh, uh, Center 70 meetings with sign-up sheets, also based on the neighborhood Facebook page and some door-to-door -door work, 113 invitations to the survey went out. Of these, 70 were returned. Of these 70 returns, they constitute 64 different homes. Here is the, there's only two questions. Here is the first question. Which of the following impacts of new building are you concerned about? Please check all that apply. 70 answered, zero skipped. Now this is a bit hard to read, but I believe every councillor and the mayor has a copy of this. There are two ties for most important on this page. The first one is the very first one, and I'll read it. Increased surface water runoff resulting in possible damage to adjacent homes and or properties. Also tied at 87.14% is loss of trees that hold soil and retain water causing increased overland flow. Close to this at 80% at the, uh, just the second one there is insufficient water and sewer capacity. And just below that, reduction of green space on lots due to overbuilding. Just a bit below that is the result of diversion of groundwater caused by new foundations. And just below that, elevated foundations and grading causing changes in surface water runoff. Again, there were just two questions. And the second question is this. Which of the following proactive measures for context-sensitive development would you like to see applied to new housing in Reddendale? Please check all that apply. There were 67 responses and three skipped. Here at 92%, the most important concern was context-sensitive drainage example, unalterable finished site elevations and drainage plans that prevent overland flow onto adjacent properties. At 82% is context-sensitive side yard setbacks. Example, side yard setbacks determined by the zoning bylaw to be in keeping with the general neighborhood. At 80% is context-sensitive front yard setback. Example, the average front yard setback of the two adjacent buildings. And close behind was context-sensitive roof height example the average height of the roofs of the two adjacent properties. Those are the results of the survey, and I would like to entertain any questions. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Councillor Stroud. Yes, thank you, Your Worship, and thank you for the presentation. My father was a professor of statistics, and he would always ask uh, if the survey size was large enough to be representative or meaningful. So in this case, you've got 70 responses from 113 invitations. Do you have any idea how many uh, residents are in the area that's being discussed? Uh, I don't know the exact number of the residents, but I can tell you that we have almost 100% of the residences, residents interested in the neighborhood. Thank you. So I'm, I guess I'm guessing that it is statistically relevant and uh, therefore the the results are meaningful. Thank you for uh, presenting them in such a clear fashion. Okay, seeing no other questions, thank you, thank you very much. Okay, our fifth and final delegation this evening will invite Scott Carey to speak to Council with respect to information report number five, respect to document.
Uh, good evening, and thank you for uh, the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Scott Carey, and I wanted to come here today to voice some concerns that myself and others share with respect to pet licensing in Kingston. First off, I want to thank Paige Agnew for organizing a meeting last week with the CEO of DocuPet. Um, I appreciate that you and Mr. Goodwin uh, took time out of your busy schedules to listen to the concerns of Kingstonians and foster further dialogue between all parties. Having learned more about DocuPet at our meeting, um, I left feeling even more uneasy about the future of this public-private partnership in Kingston. Firstly, I'm worried that DocuPet's aggressive door-to-door -door marketing strategy poses a risk both to the safety of DocuPet's employees and the privacy of Kingstonians. As most of you are probably aware, the vast majority of complaints that were filed to the city about DocuPet representatives have been discredited. We have been told time and again that reports of DocuPet employees peering into windows or trespassing are simply untrue, yet there are people such as Kaylee who uh, was good enough to come here today and who was at our meeting last, last Wednesday uh, whose experience pr proves otherwise. This isn't to say that all of the complaints launched against DocuPit are therefore true. Rather, my point is to remind you all that some of them are true. I would like to see the city do more to acknowledge the validity of some people's experiences and be open to the possibility that some of DocuPet's breaches in privacy have either gone unreported and or unwitnessed while people were away from their homes. Furthermore, I would like to see DocuPet permanently abandon their aggressive door-to-door -door strategy, not only out of concern for the privacy of Kingstonians, but also the safety of their employees. Kingstonians have made it clear in sometimes ugly ways, as Mr. Goodwin pointed to, uh, that they do not want government hired officials peeping and listening into their homes. I asked uh, the CEO of DocuPet if they will continue to use this strategy despite its many problems, and he could not give a definitive answer. I asked that the city protect the safety of Kingstonians and put pressure on DocuPet to discontinue this door-to-door -door strategy. Changing focus, I'm also concerned about DocuPet's business model, privacy policy, and strategic, strategic vision after meeting with their CEO last Wednesday. As a company, DocuPet is still in its infancy. They aren't all that profitable right now because their focus is on growing their database of users. This is part of the reason behind offering their service to businesses and advertisers for free. Once they grow a bit more, however, it is likely that they will monetize their database which citizens are currently being legislated to join, and charge businesses to advertise directly to us. I speak for many others when I say that I have no interest in publicly funding a private advertising company, nor do I have any interest in receiving more spam. Additionally, I do not want to be legislated to provide my personal and pets information to a company with as vague and ambiguous a privacy policy as DocuPets. Without going into too much detail, their privacy policy allows them to sell some personal and pet information, as it currently stands, to third parties, and also permits third parties to track the behavior of DocuPet customers using web beacon technology. I brought DocuPet's privacy policy to the attention of the CEO last week, which he admitted is purposely worded to allow for some flexibility in their business model moving forward. Once again, I have no interest in publicly funding a company that intends to profit from the sale and storage of my personal information. Such a move goes far beyond what is both practically and ethically necessary for the maintenance and operation of a successful municipal pet licensing program. This brings me to my final point, which is that DocuPet oversteps its bounds as a pet licensing service. An effective pet licensing program does not and should not require peeping or listening into people's homes, advertising, or sharing personal and digital information with businesses. I strongly believe that the city can develop better and safer pet licensing systems, practices, jobs, and policies than what DocuPet has been able to demonstrate thus far, and urge the city to think carefully about DocuPet's future in the winter of 2018, which I think is when their current contract expires. 30 seconds. Thanks. Um, it is true that they are a local business, um, and I support local businesses. I want to see local businesses succeed. Um, but Kingstonians need not be legislated to support local businesses, particularly those which threaten both their privacy and the future of good municip municipality jobs in town. 
There are many other models and approaches to licensing pets besides DocuPets' private advertising model, and I trust that these two will be given serious consideration over the course of the next year. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Are there any questions? Deputy Mayor Neal. Just quickly, um, I know that DocuPet has, uh, we've all received emails uh, quite strongly uh, denying any invasion of privacy. I was wondering if your colleague might uh, feel comfortable describing what her experience was. Sorry to put you on the spot. Not a problem. Um, yeah, so essentially I was at home when the DocuPet employee came by my house um, and I was sitting in my front room, which has a window that looks onto where my front door is. And so I saw the young woman come up to my um, my front porch uh, and look into my window and then leave a door hanger um, on my on my front doorstep. Um, so I was obviously very upset about this, so I went outside to see what she had left. Um, and I saw that it was a flyer for DocuPet. At the time, I had never heard of DocuPet, so I assumed it was just a company at, like advertising. And so I you know, was very upset, but didn't think more about it uh, until a few weeks later when I received a letter in the mail with City of Kingston letterhead on it, threatening uh, basically consequences from bylaw, saying that I would be fined and that bylaw would be following up because I had been flagged as a pet owner, which clearly happened because she looked in my window um, and saw an animal inside my house. Are you, are you just curious, are you a cat or a dog owner? I actually had a friend visiting um, who had a dog. And so that's a whole other layer to this problem that it doesn't even correctly identify pet owners. It just labels people who had happened to have an animal within their house when the young women came by um, to either listen or, or look into someone's house. And I just have to say that someone listening at my door is just as big of an invasion into my privacy as someone looking into my windows. Thank you. Councillor Sinek. That was mostly my question, too, and I'll save the other questions for the information report. Thank you. Okay. Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Carey. Is it fair to say that to sum up the, your objections uh, to the program is that uh, it places, the, the DocuPet model places the need for individual pet licensing as a priority above that of individual privacy and the other concerns that you've mentioned. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I, I hope some of that came through in what I, what I said here today. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it is something to applaud. Like the compliance rates have gone up, that's good, but it's also important to ask how that uh, happened. Um, and some of the stories, again, I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that everyone's story out there is is true i think people have gone to great lengths to look into each situation but there are a lot of stories out there actually if you look around on social media if you talk to people around town not everyone has reported them we can't even begin to think that everyone was home to witness them so um i would just like a bigger sort of conversation about how did those compliance rates get to the point where they are and, and are we comfortable with continuing that sort of approach, uh, you know, to, yeah, it, you know, it's, it's good. It, it, we, can, we can be happy about uh, increased compliance rates, but I, I don't think people are happy about the ways, and the methods in which it, they were accomplished. Councillor Bohm? Oh, I'm sorry. Councillor Stroud, you have one more question. Yeah, I have another question. Uh, so, obviously, all of us have gone door to door when we, when we ran for election, and, uh, and nobody ever accused us of invasion of privacy uh, being, and many times we discovered people that had pets, obviously, uh, wasn't, wasn't something that came up in conversation about licensing or not in my personal campaign. But I'm wondering, so with the knowledge that there are people that legitimately do go to your door, the mailman and, and you know, politicians, uh, other people like that, what is the difference between those visits to, uh, that don't invade privacy and uh, what DocuPet is, is doing? Well, I think that you've just identified two public servants in the mail, you know, mailmen and politicians. And, uh, you know, I, that's not to give them a, a sort of a clear, a blank slate on this issue either. Maybe, that, maybe a larger conversation needs to happen there as well. But um, I think that people take issue with 
in this particular instance, a, a third party uh, that has been hired by the city, um, it just it seems a little Orwellian. Uh, so. Am I, am I oh. I also, a politician coming to your door um, to offer information doesn't have um, bylaw and financial consequences attached to it. So someone coming to my door and now my name being part of a database that the that a third party private company owns and can use to threaten me with bylaw fines and consequences, that's a much uh, bigger problem for individuals, I think, than just someone stopping by to give them information. And I think that's why someone raised earlier, if DocuBet had just been coming around and leaving flyers saying, hey, you know, we're a company that the city is using to raise awareness around licensing, I, don't, I just can't predict that any of this uproar would have, would have happened. Councillor Bull. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. So it seems like what I'm hearing is that it's not actually the city that, that's coming around and kind of enforcing these rules. And that, and that seems to be the biggest concern. Is that accurate? Is that it's that it is a third party? It's not actually kind of the city. Well, I don't. Um, I don't. I would expect the city wouldn't. Have, I mean, the city never did in their pet licensing program prior to hiring DocuPet try these methods. So, I, I wouldn't expect that from the city to sort of launch that sort of aggressive campaign. Okay, and then a follow up would be: you mentioned that obviously you know pet licensing is important, and, and you're not against that. So realizing kind of the, the need for that and, and all the benefits, I guess, that, that can come with it and the fact that almost every city and municipality has some type of licensing, could you offer a couple compromise um, sit, like recommendations as, as how we would get there? And I know, I know you mentioned DocuPet, but what, what would be somewhere of a middle ground there in your opinion? Um, yeah, so, I mean, uh, a lot of this depends on where the, what the city decides to do with their relationship with DocuPet in the future. Um, should they decide not to move forward with that? I would hope that the city can create some jobs uh, within the municipality that, um, you know, clearly we have the infrastructure in place to accept garbage tags and parking permits online. So I would assume that some of that uh, can be and has been done for pet licenses as well. Um, and I think that we can do, we can raise awareness. Um, and, and I think, you know, one of the things to come out of this DocuPet fiasco over the last year is that it ironically has raised a ton of awareness around the city of Kingston uh, with respect to pet licensing. But I think there are other ways to, to raise awareness um, without having to do the door to door, or if you're going to do door to door, um, leave a note in the in the mailbox, uh, a little advertisement. Social media is pretty good these days. People in the city know how to, you know, work social media. So, yeah. thank you, Councillor Turn. Thank you, and through you, I have a question for the young lady behind you. Um, what did you do to resolve the situation? Did you contact the city, and did they did you tell them that the pet wasn't yours, and did they retract the bylaw infraction from you? I did call the city. Um, I ended up having a very long conversation um, with the city staff uh, about the situation. Um, and the only way for me to resolve the problem was to um, give my personal information, was to call DocuPet myself and give them my personal information so that they could check their database and correct the problem, which I don't, and again, just goes back to the initial problem where I don't want to give my information to this company and I have to do that in order to resolve the problem with them having my, um, that I don't want to create by giving them my personal information. Do you know what I mean? So I don't want to register with this company and the only way to remove my name from this list is to give them my personal information. So I wasn't really willing to do that with them. Um, I also had a meeting um, just last week, like Scott was talking about. Um, and so we talked about it further then. Um, and now we're here today. So I, um, I would like the situation re um, remedied. I'm not quite sure what the best way to do that is. OK. Thank you. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, we have no further delegations. We have no briefings this evening. Are there any petitions to present? Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor. I just have a petition from the uh, residents of um, 
1104 and 1110 Italia Lane. Uh, this petition has been signed by 100% of the residents, um, six or seven of them, and they uh, are concerned about the access road to uh, McAdoo's Lane, and um, because they, um, there's construction happening there, um, sorry about that, um, the eastern portion of McAdoo's Lane, um, uh, they would like it to be designated as uh, only a passenger for, for passenger vehicles. There's uh, developments happening there and the noise, and so they're asking uh, the city to consider their petition and their request. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Seeing no other petitions, uh, we have no motions of congratulations, recognition, sympathy, condolences, or speedy recovery. Uh, we do have one deferred motion. Number one, that the resignation of Councillor Hutchison from the Planning Committee be received with regret, and that Councillor Blank be appointed to the Planning Committee for a term ending November 30th, 2018. So first of all, uh, do I have a volunteer for Planning Committee? Okay. Seeing, uh, seeing no hands, uh, Mr. Clerk, uh, yes, Councillor Hutchison. I would like them to be separated, please. They should have been separated the first so, time. So before we causes. do that, <clears throat> before we do that, I would like to offer an amendment to the motion. If I have a seconder. So I should give the, uh, chair over for this. Deputy Mayor Neal, will you take the chair, please? I will indeed, and I recognize you. Thank you. This is administrative, but it's uh, a motion to amend, to delete paragraph two, and essentially to readjust the bylaws so that for the next year, planning committee would have five members. Uh, I will look for a seconder. Deputy Mayor Neal. Uh, yes. <laughs> I will, uh, Councillor Holland has seconded. And I would like to pass the chair uh, to who is the last deputy mayor so I can speak to this. Thank you, Councillor Turner. I take the chair and I recognize you. I guess the frustration is that yes, planning is the busiest committee outside of council, we meet as often as council, we have very, very large agendas. And I appreciate that it's, it's a challenge, but it's also a critically, critically important committee. We've got a lot of business coming up. And it's really frustrating when we have councillors who possibly aren't in on any umbrella committees and here we are about to reduce the second most committee important committee of this chamber because we can't find a sixth person and just so people are aware can i ask the people who are currently on planning to just raise your hand so people can recognize that there are indeed people willing to work really, really hard on this committee. Thank you. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna call a point of privilege on that last point. I think that that was an unfair comment uh, related to, um, to colleagues around the table and I, I would respectfully offer that I think everyone around this table works hard. I will. I, I leave that to the judgment of the I the will chair. withdraw that comment. Thank you. I'd like to give the chair back to you? No, I give it back to you then. Okay. That's right. Any further comments or questions? Yes, Councillor Canton. I just think it's worth pointing out I would sit on planning. Uh, real people who do what I do for a living historically have until the ruling that recently happened. So um, I'm inter interested to see what the new integrity commissioner says about me uh, being involved in planning because since the city has existed, people like me have been voting on stuff like that and they have been on planning. The ruling contradicted the last 50 years of Kingston City Council, which everyone seemed to kind of ignore. I don't know how or why that happened, 
but uh, the whole concept of a, a realtor not being able to be on uh, planning is totally new and out of left field and not in accordance with uh, the way the city has conducted itself since it existed. Um, if the new integrity commissioner allows me to do my job, I would love to do that. Yes, and I'll recognize Councillor George. Thank you, Worship. Um, I think first of all, I'd just like to add on to what you had to say. I think what the Councillor had to say earlier is completely out of order. In fact, may be in violation of our own code of conduct for isolating particular councillors. Um, but much like Councillor Candon, um, I spoke to the Mayor uh, about this uh, about a month ago. Uh, being on the planning committee again, and because of the fact my business is continuing to grow, I'm recognizing more and more conflict than I had before. So my my actual participation on the planning committee may be moot. So therefore, uh, that's my explanation. Not that I feel I should have to give one, thank you, Councillor Neal, but just for the general public to know that some of us do have legitimate reasons why. Thank you. Thank you, and Councillor Stroud. Thank you. Well, while we're on the subject, uh, I'm just going to bring up a couple of other reasons uh, some of us may not have volunteered. I can't speak for anyone else, but uh, personally, uh, with a salary of 29000 it's what is a supposedly part-time position, as most of us hold uh, other employment or uh, pursuits, and, uh, and, and that, we all know that that's not actually the case in today's day and age. Uh, city Council is the City of Kingston. Are required to work at least 40 hours a week uh, when you take into account all of the committee work and research that goes along with it. Uh, it's never been exactly quantified, but planning, planning committee is generally accepted as being the committee with the heaviest workload. If it were quantified, there are others that are heavy, such as Heritage, which I chair, and uh, there's sort of this unwritten rule that you'd you wouldn't normally be the chair of heritage and the chair of planning, which is why Councillor Shell, when she was chairing planning, did not chair heritage, which she is a member of. Um, so as you see, we've, amongst ourselves, we've sort of come to an, a, an arrangement to spread the work out fairly evenly. Hope, you know, that is the hope, but that should be the fair thing to do. However, uh, without, uh, I, I don't actually personally uh, hold el any ill will to any of uh, my colleagues here for the different uh, sizes of workload. But at some point, maybe the clerk's office or somebody should be quantifying the workload because at the uh, salary that we're being paid, uh, it's, it's a pretty tough sell to get people to volunteer to something that is probably 10 hours a week, which would be a part-time job all by itself. So uh, that's the reason for uh, the lack of volunteers. I appreciate that Councillor Neal is definitely working at least 40 hours a week, if not 60, on council matters. And he's okay with that, and, and I understand that, and he's a very generous person, and that's maybe the way it should be. But some of us have to, uh, are still in our phase of our career where we have to support a family, and the current council salary is not adequate for the workload. Thank you. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? I will call the question. Um, can I just ask for quick one quick clarification from the clerk, if I might? If we do end up with somebody who can come forward and volunteer later, will that, that require a reconsideration to go back to six? To your worship, yes, it will. But I don't believe that'll be a problem having to uh, make the appointment. In that case, I again encourage my colleagues and I will support the motion. Yes, I am asleep at the switch. I return the chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so now on the motion as amended, is there any further comment? Okay, seeing none, then we will call the vote, please. Please vote. Uh, 
and that carries. Okay, moving on to reports. First, we have report number five from the CAO. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Turner, that report number five from the Chief Administrative Officer consent be received and adopted. Okay, so there are eight clauses. We are going to separate number six and seven for Councillor Bohm. Are there any other separations to request, Councillor Osanek? Report number five, please. Okay, thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal, number one. Okay, seeing no other separations, we will vote on the balance of the items first. So Clause 2, Bill 68, Modernizing Ontario's Municipal Legislation Act 2017, Amendments to the Council Procedural Bylaw. Clause 3, a bylaw to amend bylaw number 2008-182, a bylaw to adopt the recorded information management policy and records retention schedule for the City of Kingston, housekeeping amendments. Clause 4, close and declare surplus road allowance at 1645 Sydenham Road. And Clause 8, annual amendment to fees and charges bylaw number 2005-1. So we will call the vote. And that carries. Clause 1, 2018 calendar of council and standing committee meetings. Deputy Mayor Neal. Thank you very much. Um, I did share this with, with our deputy clerk earlier in the week. On March 1st, there's a planned uh, a meeting of, of plan, the planning committee. And the problem is it's also the day when there is a provincial nomination meeting. Uh, going on for the provincial election here in Kingston. And so uh, I know at least two of our five members probably will not be there at, uh, on that date. I checked with the clerk, deputy clerk, and there is a distinct possibility that we could move it to the 8th without creating some difficulty. Uh, perhaps they could uh, comment on that or if we if I could move that amendment okay um, mr. Kirk do you have any comment it's your worship no so I think that would require uh, a motion to amend I would so move that amendment if I could and if I can find a piece of paper I'll write it out I should have written it already so okay so this is a motion to amend. Okay, so this is a motion to amend that would change the March 1st planning committee meeting to be rescheduled to March the 8th. Nope, it's been moved okay. by Deputy it's Mayor Neal. No, the first, the first doesn't show up on the map, but the first is, in fact, marked as a, a planning meeting, I believe. Okay, so on so, the calendar... Oh, on the colored one, it Yes, does. so on the calendar of meetings, so this would be to amend the calendar so that the planning committee would move from March 1st to March the 8th. So it's moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Turner. Is there any discussion on the amendment? Councillor Bohm? Yeah, I, I just want to caution here because we're starting to just sort of go into the, the calendar and just started picking out dates because certain people may or not be there, may or may not be there. And my caution here is that I'm sure we all have other things on certain days which may create conflicts. And if we start doing this at this point, we're never going to be able to kind of get a calendar at all. So I'm, I don't think I'm going to support this, and the reason is I'm worried about the precedent that it sets. And I could pull my schedule up, and I could go through all the dates and, and say that I have other things going on too, and I may not make meetings. But I think if we all did that, it would just get to be so convoluted. And at some point, we have to set a schedule, 
and we have to kind of abide by that and we have to provide that to the public and these are the dates that they are so I'm not going to support this because I'm worried about where this could go in the future and if we all decide to start coming in and saying you know I've got a provincial this I've, I've got a wedding at that day and, and yada 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 it could just be never ending so I, I can't support this sorry thank you uh, is there anybody else that wishes to speak Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, actually, Councillor Bohm, thank you for bringing that up. I think I agree with you. Um, not that the reason isn't a good one in this case, but uh, I, I think if I'm if faced with the choice of being able to alter our, uh, our permanent schedule at uh, Council's whim uh, or to uh, keep, uh, you know, first and third Thursday of every month is everybody knows that's when planning normally happens and uh, it gets it, it gets unmanageable if we make if we start making changes I think you're right the, the precedent is it, although the, the reason may be valid in this case the precedent is of, of a higher importance so I essentially am pl placing a higher priority on a set schedule that we've gr agreed with that's traditional and uh, and I place that as a higher at a higher level than uh, this particular amendment. So I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Turner. I have a question for staff. If we would have quorum with three people on the planning committee, if we could go forward with the meeting. Yes, it's, there's quorum with three. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Mayor Neal, will you take the chair? I will, and I recognize you. So, so I'm just going to ask one question of council. Is anybody else going to ask for a change to the calendar for 2018? Okay. So given that answer, I'm happy to support this one request, but I think that the caution and concern that has been raised is absolutely valid. But given that there's no other changes, I think it's reasonable. Thank you. Thank you, and I return the chair and raise my hand. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Deputy Mayor Neal, you have the last word. Thank you. Uh, this created a lot more debate than I anticipated. I thought it was a fairly straightforward request for courtesy. I have never asked for a change of, of date in the past. Uh, I have always, at my attendance record in all the committees, is very, very strong, uh, but when I've had to be away, I send my regrets. Uh, so frankly, I'm a little surprised that this won't be unanimous as a courtesy vote, but such is politics, I guess. So thank you very much. Okay, thank you. So we will call the vote then on the motion to amend. Please vote. And that carries by a vote of 10 to 3. On the motion or on the recommendation as amended, we'll call the vote, please. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, on to clause number five. Approval of the project and operating grant recommendations for the 2018 City of Kingston Heritage Fund as administered by the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites. Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. So we're being asked to approve tonight the disbursement of the Heritage Fund to various museums, art galleries, and historic sites uh, for $250,000. Um, but if we look at the report um, on page 161, um, originally in the culture plan, it was $100,000 that the Heritage Fund was created with. That's now gone to 250. But I have my question to staff is, going down memory lane, I think the original ask for the Heritage Fund was a lot more when it was recommended in the heritage plan, was it not? Um, we can see in the report that there's like a double 
of what we have available request out there from all the art galleries. And over time, hopefully we'll be able to, you know, get closer to meeting the full demand of the requests from the art galleries. So back in 2013, oh, museums, museums and art galleries, right? Not art galleries? Oh, okay, sorry. Of the, just the museums then. It was, oh yeah, okay. So back in 2013, um, what was the original re um, recommendation in the culture plan? Mr. Brigginton. Thank you, and through you, Your Worship. Um, the original culture plan approved back in 2010 recommended the creation of a heritage fund that was comparable to what was then the existing arts fund. So in 2010, it was, it was $500,000. But um, you also have to keep in mind that the landscape at the time was quite different and that the culture plan also recommended that the Arts Council perhaps be considered as the body through which the Heritage Fund would be administered because there was no equivalent on the heritage side. So uh, this has been an, an incremental program sort of implementation strategy that we've been following. Uh, the, cult the Heritage Fund didn't come on until 2013 because we chose to uh, first invest in the development of the Kingston Association of Museums, Art Galleries, and Historic Sites. Uh, it previously had been a voluntary run organization, and so we worked with them to incorporate, uh, invest in the, the building of that organization and, and help them develop the capacity to do the Heritage Fund. And then it was in concert with CAM that we negotiated that we would start in 2013 with a $100,000 uh, grant total specifically for project grants at that time because the community also wasn't necessarily uh, in the habit of applying for uh, operating and program grants related to heritage at that time. So it's been a joint effort uh, to build the fund, build the sector, and build the capacity of CAM. And so what you're seeing evolve over time is a sort of collaborative effort to grow all those three different areas of endeavor. And in fact, statistically, uh, when we look at the Heritage Fund at this time, uh, when you get into comparative grant or competitive grant programs, uh, there will always be uh, an inability to meet all of the funding requests. It's part of the nature of how it works. Uh, but we are actually seeing the Heritage Fund track at a higher success level than uh, the Arts Fund when you look at the two side by side. So there are fewer applicants to the Heritage Fund compared to the Arts Fund uh, by almost a third. And so the amount of monies that are needed are smaller, but then we're also seeing uh, larger grant requests, but the grant requests are actually more successful in terms of the number of grants approved and the level of the granting being offered, even if it's not the full amount requested. So that's to be expected of this kind of granting program as well. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Ms. Mayor, I would just uh, like to add a, just a couple of points of, uh, of clarification or additional information. Um, two things. One is that we do include the amount for the grant program every year on the, in the, uh, the budget, so Council does have access to that, and, and Council has approved, obviously, um, the, these particular amounts. Uh, and I just want to point out, in terms of grant programs um, and working with organizations like United Way, community foundations, I don't know of any grant program that is actually able to meet the demand of uh, the, the requests that are coming in. Uh, so this would not be unusual in terms of having more requests than what we can actually fund. Thank you. Um, I do appreciate that in the report it gives what the forecast would be for 2018, 2019, and you know maybe even increase to 400,000 by 2020. And I know that too. You have to work in the constraints that council puts on staff, you know, based on our tax increase and how quickly that fund for the Heritage Fund can grow in our uh, base allocations. Thank you. Thank you. So we will call the vote on Clause 5. And that carries. Clause six, smart city strategy and progress update report. We'll call the vote. And that carries. 
Clause 7, Strategic Priorities Update. Madam Deputy Clerk. Um, I would suggest, since we have split this for Councillor Boehm and he is currently out of the room, that we vote on Paragraph 2 before Paragraph 1. Okay, so we will first call the vote on Paragraph 2, that Council receive the balance of this support specifically dealing with Utilities Kingston. Please vote. And that carries. Councillor Baum, you can return. Okay, so we will now call the vote on the remainder of, of the clause, paragraph one. Please vote. And that carries. Report number six from Planning Committee. It's my pleasure to present report number six from the Planning Committee, duly moved and seconded. Thank you. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Turner, that report number six from the Planning Committee be received and adopted. Okay, so there are three clauses. Would anyone like the clauses separated? Councillor Osterhoff? Clause three. Okay, so first we will call the vote on clauses one and two together. Clause one is approval of an application for Community Improvement Plan Amendment, Brownfields Community Improvement Plan. Clause two, approval of an application for zoning bylaw amendment 1010 and 1028 Portsmouth Avenue. Please vote. And that carries. Clause three, approval of revisions to the City of Kingston tree bylaw. Councillor Osterhoff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I just want to take a, a moment to um, just review uh, the process that we went through and uh, um, just most, mostly positive words. It, it's not a, it's only a few words on paper here, but really it was um, quite an effort. Um, and um, when um, I was elected um, through Countryside, uh, this was the one issue that seemed to come up a lot. And so I knew that uh, when I took this place here, it was going to become something that was really important to many, many member, uh, citizens and my, our constituents in, in Countryside. And so um, I took it on and um, I, I just want to say that um, I've learned a lot through it. And I, I do, um, it was something that's very contentious and a very, very uh, high value in the Countryside. Many, many of our farming community and just our rural community, many, many people are involved with uh, trees and wooded lots and uh, it's, just a, it's just something that's really important to recognize in the rural area that we value. We are stewards of the land, many of us. And so when you get into this area of making bylaws, it's a sensitive point really. And so I entered into it a little bit of, um, as a rookie, I guess, but uh, I learned a lot and I began to read. Uh, the more I read it, the more I understood it. And um, I certainly want to um, thank the city as well. Um, I think um, we're here often just how good the staff are. And I, I, I really learned to trust uh, Greg Newman here and um, Anne Marie Yuzibioi. Sorry, I didn't say her name right, but um, they um, did come across very honestly and openly. And just as you um, welcome us when you, um, Mayor Patterson, you talk about putting our minds and hearts together. I really think that kind of happened here. So we don't just hear it, but we, we live it. And um, it's a bit of a working document, maybe. Uh, I think we admitted to that, but I think we, we really got to the heart of the matter, what we, we didn't want to happen. And, and that's where we, we really found common ground. There was a reason 
reason to pursue this. <laughs> so I want to thank you, Greg and Anne Marie, for that. And also people like George Sutherland, most of you know, he really is a dedicated citizen and uh, really was um, um, an advocate for this too and uh, was involved in addressing many, many concerns. He lives it in many ways and, and, and many in the rural community. So I wanted to say that and um, that I've learned a lot. I hope, I think that I really appreciated Greg and Anne Marie for the listening that they did. We had uh, many different meetings uh, on our own, but also with with uh, the, the constituents and everybody had a say. And that's really, really important. So I wanna thank uh, the staff for that, for fulfilling that, being patient and uh, getting to this point. And uh, I think it's a, it's, um, it's a good, good product and we should be proud of it as, uh, uh, as uh, Ryan, and Ryan was part of this too. I wanna thank Ryan, um, sorry about that, Ryan. Uh, it's been great to work with him on it. So we've, we've accomplished something that's good and um, I, I just wanna say that out loud and thank you all. Thank you, Councillor Bowman. Thank you, Worship Mithru. I just want to echo, echo some of my colleagues' uh, comments there. And the first would be to thank staff. This was a very collaborative effort. Um, truly, lots of time. Um, there were a couple times where it came back and it looked like it was uh, maybe going to come forward and then some concerns were raised and we took it back and we polished it again. It went back to, to the Rural Advisory Committee and uh, some of the feedback that I'm sure, uh, you know, Councillor Oosterhop will get and I will too is, you know, especially in the rural areas, Sometimes the only time they see somebody from the city is to enforce a bylaw, and it happens to be a tree bylaw, and so they kind of felt maybe a little ostracized or, or targeted in that way, and, and that was never the intention of this bylaw, so staff did a great job there. They definitely worked with, uh, with uh, Councillor Roosterhoff and myself, and, and in the main thing, working with residents, so I think we have a product here that is really a good example of how a bylaw can be something that is made basically approved by council, but it was made from staff and residents' input. And this is a true example of something that I believe, honestly, wholeheartedly, it's gonna work and it's gonna fit. Is it perfect? Nothing's ever perfect, but I think it'll stand the test of time and we'll be able to review it little by little and make those minor amendments. So kudos to staff and, and all the hard work of everybody else and my colleague there and all the time that everybody put into this and, and also to the residents that came out to those meetings and provided that input because really it's, it's ultimately only going to work if we have that public feedback. So thanks again to everybody. Okay, so we will call the vote on Clause 3. And that carries. Report number seven from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. Yes, it's my pleasure to present report number seven from Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee. Duly moved and seconded. Moved by Deputy Mayor Neal, seconded by Councillor Holland, that report number seven from the Municipal Accessibility Advisory Committee be received and adopted. So there's just the one clause, City of Kingston 2018 to 2022 Accessibility Plan. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Report number eight from Committee of the Whole. Moved by Councillor George, seconded by Councillor Turner, that report number eight from the Committee of the Whole be received and adopted. So uh, there are a number of pecuniary interests to manage, so I'm going to ask if the uh, clerk and deputy clerk will uh, walk us through this vote, please. So uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. We'll follow the same process we did during the Committee of the Whole. Um, the deputy clerk will identify uh, which individuals have to be out of the room based on the pecuniary interest and she'll also read out the recommendations as well prior to the vote. Thank you. Our first vote will be on clauses one, two, and three. Councillor Bohm, you're excused. Okay. 
Okay. The titles of these three clauses are Clause 1, Approval of the 2018 Operating Budgets for the Municipal Utilities. Two, approval of rate changes for the 2018 appliance rental business. And three, approval of local distribution rate changes for natural gas. Please vote. That carries. Councillor Baum, you can return, please. Our next vote will be um, for Clause 4, which is the approval of the Municipal Operating and Capital Budgets. The first vote will be on Paragraphs 1, 5, 6, 8, 9, 11, and 12. Clause 1, that Council approve the 2018 General Municipal Tax-Supported Operating Budget in the amount of $365,821,078, less $12,376, $12,376,426 approved in recommendations 2, 3, and 4. And paragraph 5, that any variance between final assessment growth and the growth estimates included in the 2018 General Municipal Operating Budget be transferred to, funded from the Working Fund Reserve, to offset unanticipated variances in assessment growth in the future years as a stabilization measure, and that Council approve the 2018 Municipal Capital Budget in the amount of $52,505,871, less $5,848,705, approved in the next recommendation as follows. Proposed capital expenditures, $52,505,871. Financing general municipal reserve funds, $41,311,871. Debentures, uh, $7 million, government grants, $720,000, contributions from others, uh, $3,474,000, with total fi financing of $52,505,871. Paragraph 8, that Council received the following provided as part of the budget documentation. A, 15-year capital expenditure forecast. B, capital works in progress listing as at September 30th, 2017. C, municipal reserve fund schedules of continuity. Paragraph nine, that the city treasurer be authorized to report the approved budget estimates for 2018 in accordance with public sector accounting board PSAB reporting requirements as an attachment to the bylaw. 11, that council requests that the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board report back to council once the community engagement process is complete with detailed information on the public engagement process and an assessment of all service expansion options, including the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Services Master Plan recommended option to expand the existing Pittsburgh branch. And finally, paragraph 12, that council be provided with the opportunity to review information and provide input on the preferred option to expand services in Kingston East before any final decisions are made by the Kingston Frontenac Public Library Board and any capital funds be spent on this budget item. Please vote. That carries. Our next vote will be on paragraph two. Councillors Candon and Hutchison are excused. Paragraph 2 reads that Council approve the following 2018 General Municipal Operating Budget item. A. Community Services, Housing and Social Services Rent Supplement and Nonprofit Housing Providers in the amount of $6,143,487. Please vote.
That carries. Councillor Hutchison, you may return. Councillor Candon, you can remain out for this vote, please. Paragraph 3, that Council approve the following 2018 General Municipal Operating Budget Item. A. Community Services, Housing and Social Services Administration and Employment Assistance Community Services Investment and Provincial Programs in the amount of $5,182,939. Please vote. That carries. Councillor Candon can return. Paragraph 4, and I note that Deputy Mayor Neal has excused himself from the room. This clause reads that Council approved the Hospital Foundation 2018 budgeted transfer in the amount of $1,050,000. Please vote. And that carries. Next, we have paragraph seven, that council approved the 2018 municipal capital budget for housing and social services in the amount of $5,848,705 as follows. Proposed capital expenditures, 5,848,000. No, excuse me, Councillor Cannon, you're excused for this. I'll start at the beginning. That council approved the 2018 municipal capital budget for housing and social services in the amount of $5,848,705 as follows. Proposed capital expenditures, $5,848,705. Financing from general municipal reserve funds, $1,320,000. Government grants, $3,778,705. Contributions from others, $750,000. Total financing, $5,848,705. Please vote. That carries. Uh, Councillor Cannon is still excused from this vote, as are uh, Councillor Boehm, Councillor Hutchison, and Deputy Mayor Neal. Paragraph 10, that the necessary bylaws be established to formally adopt these estimates and be given three readings as at the December 19, 2017 meeting of council. Please vote. All councillors may return, please. Ladies and gentlemen, you've now approved the capital and operating budget for the 2018 year. Okay, thank you very much. So moving on to report number nine from the Environment, Infrastructure and Transportation Policies Committee. Thank you, Your Worship. I rise to present said report number nine from EITP, moved and seconded for council's consideration. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Stroud, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal, that report number nine from the Environment, Infrastructure, and Transportation Policies Committee be received and adopted. 
So there's just the one clause, community bike share program. We'll call the vote, please. And that carries. Okay, moving on to uh, information reports. If you have any questions, uh, just raise your hand as I read through them. Number one, Emergency Management Program Review 2017. Number two, City Workplace Policies Anti-Discrimination. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Worship. Um, the, uh, first of all, I was happy to see this report as an update, and there is training that we, will all be we should all anticipate um, for members of staff and council. And I guess the, the question that I have sort of goes back to the original discussion um, that brought forward this recommendation, which was to do with, uh, I believe Councillor McLaren noted uh, systemic racism and that there were calls for institutions like municipalities to address systemic racism. Uh, the, as part of that, it seems that the report does talk a lot about anti-discrimination practices and policies that are sort of central to, to workplaces. Um, though the other side of discrimination, I would, I would argue, would, has to do with inclusion. Um, and there, so I'm, I'm wondering if through this work, staff see any opportunity to improve diversity uh, while there are diversity policies for in the hiring practices of the city of Kingston uh, and most other governments and, and large organizations, we don't have something similar when it comes to diversity on council. And we're all here because people decided to vote for us, not because um, not because there was a policy so, involved. So question, yeah, question. The, the question has to do with um, looking at ways to improve representation of marginalized groups through this process of exploring, um, exploring anti-discrimination in a deeper sense as opposed to simply providing, uh, ensuring that policies are followed and that training is provided, for example. It's obviously, it's a, a large and loaded question. It has to do mostly with upcom an upcoming election and whether or not this could be perhaps directed at the clerks as well to see if there are, what types of measures are in place to encourage uh, diversity of candidates. Thank you. Uh, who from staff would like to take that? Mr. Clerk? It's directed at uh, for council candidates or Commissioner Leger. Uh, through your worship, I was going to address it as it relates to the city workplace and city workforce, which this was targeted to in terms of um, uh, diversity and inclusiveness. I think council has already begun some work uh, on a multitude of fronts. One with the innovative immigration initiatives funding, and I think we'll be getting a report. Uh, from uh, Commissioner Hurdle's area and Kingston Immigration Partnership uh, sometime in the early new year and some of those public awareness issues as well as workplace issues, uh, they will develop that campaign over time and I think we're going to get a report on that. So it doesn't necessarily address council, it address diversity in a bigger sense in community. In terms of workplace, this report was meant to address the motion more in terms of the training we've done on diversity, uh, our workplace policies, taking a look at uh, work that's underway with uh, workforce planning and, and migration. We talked about the MAC report that was presented earlier in terms of you know, targeting inclusiveness and diversity and look at our recruitment policies and practices. Uh, this is where we are going in terms of our strategies as it relates to the city of the corporation, city of Kingston. Uh, I don't really have a comment on the council other than we're offering council training and what I've offered in terms of Kingston Immigration Partnership coming back in early new year. Okay, uh, Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, uh, just very quickly, I believe I brought this up when we uh, first discussed this uh, with a motion. 
Um, I know that we can't make this compulsory fund for organizations like the library board and some of our housing agencies that receive the bulk of, of their funding from the city. Uh, but do, do we plan to invite those organizations uh, to attend some of these training sessions? And can we use a little moral suasion to make it happen? Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So uh, yes, we can definitely invite some of these organizations, but one of the things that we can also do is um, we can require that each organization does have some form of policies to address this. It doesn't have to be the city policy, but they should have their own policies within their organization to address, uh, to address those, and that can be part of our, our funding process. CEO Hunt. I find that reassuring. Thank you. Uh, Sorry. Uh, through you, Mr. Mayor, to, to add to that comment, uh, we would also encourage members of council that sit on those boards to uh, to ensure that this topic is brought up as part of the administration and the policy framework with the uh, boards that are represented. That's another way to uh, ensure that we have uh, uh, policies across the board, and particularly with those that we do major funding with. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Okay, number three, tender and contract awards subject to the established criteria for delegation of authority for the month of October 2017. Number four, residential rental licensing, review of other Ontario municipalities. Councillor Stroud. Thanks, Your Worship. Uh, just a question to staff about this. Uh, first of all, um, because it, it's sort of generating, it's starting to generate comment in the form of emails. There are probably more to come. Uh, just so there's not any misunderstandings, could uh, staff just uh, remind those present council, councillors, but also those watching, uh, where this idea of rental licensing originated? Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. So the this idea has been considered by the municipality um, once before, I believe it may have actually been twice before, but um, in 2014, there is a consideration of rental licensing as a component of um, what was called then the Central Accommodation Review, which was a series of studies that was done looking at some of the housing pressures um, in and around the Sydenham District specifically. And at that time, the city decided not to pursue, pursue rental licensing as it was a fairly new thing in Ontario. Oshawa was just at that point um, bringing a rental licensing program online and we were watching to see whether it was going to be successful um, what were some of the benefits they were seeing, if there were any potential drawbacks associated with that approach. And in the meantime, we've been watching that, but as we went through some discussions uh, with the Portsmouth and the Sydenham district residents um, earlier this year, which culminated in the report that went to council in May related to the interim control bylaw, one of the specific recommendations of staff not to pursue the bylaw was looking at nine or so different recommendations. And one of them was to revisit as a municipality whether or not we want to think about a rental licensing bylaw as a mechanism to deal with some of the um, some of the repeated issues or concerns that um, that neighborhoods were experiencing with respect to um, the infiltration of different types of low density residential um, rental units within neighborhoods in a way that the Planning Act, um, according to the way our bylaws are written, don't have great control mechanisms. So it was something that staff wanted to re-examine. We've taken some time since that report in May to do a best practice research um, related to what's happened since 2014, which is in the report before you tonight. And what staff are recommending is that we continue to move into 2018 with a, uh, a comprehensive community consultation strategy to reach out to the community and really have a, a thoughtful conversation in and around this issue to seek that feedback um, and to also in the process, we're in the process of looking at building a costing model so that we could understand if the municipality wanted to move forward with a rental licensing program, what's the resourcing that's going to be required to be able to support it, support it successfully. Right. I have a second question to do with what that last point about the resources. But before I, I ask it, just to comment about the uh, outreach, the, the engagement strategy and outreach that you're mentioning for early 2018. It, obviously, staff is aware that the 
uh, most likely uh, reason for any kind of uh, dissent on this type of rental licensing idea is going to come from people whose business it is to is provide rental rental uh, accommodation. So those uh, objections, I, I am assuming, uh, staff is anticipating as they do the. Uh, the outreach. I mean, it's it's logical that there will be objections from people that that fear that it will affect their bottom line. Um, so, is is that something that's openly acknowledged in this consultation process that there will be uh, some participants will be residents uh, that are have you know that are showing signs of the pressure that brought about the whole interim control bylaw debate, but also in that debate we there was. Uh, proponents that came forward against the interim control bylaw that clearly had, you know, a pecuniary reason to be doing so. Is that going to be acknowledged in the in the public consultation? Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you. So certainly when we get into debating any type of uh, policy planning matter within the neighborhood level, there's always a divergent um, opinion that happens from uh, one type of, of property owner to um, potentially whether there's a landlord situation, whether it's just that of a renter that lives in the area. So certainly staff will be prepared to um, you know, receive and, and hear a diversity of views and to try to take them all into consideration um, and to specifically not just be asking the questions related to do we or don't we want to pursue a bylaw, but if we did, what types of things should we consider? How can we make this work for you if you are a landlord? What are the benefits potentially to you as a landlord? And, and to really talk about, I think, the issue in a fulsome way so that it's not just a us versus them type of discussion, but it's really about what's best for the municipality. What do we have to gain? What are we going to need to put out in terms of resources to make it su successful? And then have council decide with all the information before them whether it's the thing to pursue or not. Thank you, that's very reassuring. Uh, I have a question also about um, the general question that's suggested by the report. Is, is it staff's uh, opinion that a rental licensing program, if properly in implemented and effectively implemented, would indeed uh, lead to greater bylaw enforcement of the existing bylaws that we already have? Ms. Sagan. Um, yes, in, in terms of our research and looking at the, the different bylaws that we administer, there's definitely some overlap between them. There's some areas that maybe aren't, um, aren't covered off um, as thoroughly that um, by stipulating in a new bylaw that covers all of these things off in a, comprehen a comprehensive way would provide us with a greater ability to have success uh, related to enforcement and if we have to go down a road of prosecution related to non-compliance. So definitely um, that's something that we've looked at and it suggested that that may be the case if we're able to craft a bylaw very specifically that, that covers off what it needs to where we, we don't have a bylaw that covers certain things now. Great. Uh, last question is very should be a very short answer. The census data that was used for this report was from 20, 2011, and it was very illuminating. It actually, I was shocked to find what a high percentage of renters there are in the in the center of the city, and in some areas that I wasn't expecting. Um, what? Uh, when is the next time the census would be updated and would have more current numbers? Do, do you know that? Thank you, and through you. Um, so when this report was being written, because of the, the time that it takes to get through the approvals process, this was written um, at the beginning of October. So what we do have now was another release of census data that came out mid-November. So we are working with that census data, and it, it gets down into more not just looking at the population, but getting into some of the more specific data areas um, that have now been released, and staff are working through that data now. So I anticipate um, we're trying to, to sort through it, get some meaning from it, do some comparative analysis, but I anticipate that will be included in any future report coming to Council. Uh, thanks, Director. I'd just like to personally uh, commend you on your efforts with this challenging subject. Thank you. Councillor Schell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I echo that. I'm, I'm really pleased to see this report and how thorough it is, and I'm, I'm very happy that we've got other cities now that are doing it. So it's true. In 2014, when I was campaigning, um, there were no examples, and there was a lot of uh, misinformation and just lack of knowledge. Um, 
With Statistics uh, Canada, the report on how much uh, there are very dense areas of renters, is it safe to th say that the City of Kingston wouldn't actually know uh, where these specific locations are, that the reason that we know there's very dense rental areas in the city is because people have self-identified to Statistics Canada as renters? Uh, thank you and through you. So there is information that's collected um, through that process and there's information that CMHC also has that, that the city um, has access to. So it's, it's definitely, um, those two are, the, are, the, are key sources of information. Um, we're just sorting through the data right now. What I'm trying to get a feel of is the geographic distribution um, by unit type. So where you have that aggregate number that's looking at the 13,000 units, I want it broken down further into three units, two units, um, and then trying to spatially look at how it's uh, distributed across the municipality. So we're just working on that mapping now. Um. And I know cost is going to come up um, from landlords um, in particular, and, and it seems by reading um, the information you have from other cities that over time you can reach a cost revenue model that becomes neutral. So we can we expect a heavy investment at the beginning and then it will uh, ease out and, and that also it looks like the um, average cost is fairly low. Uh, for the uh, landlords, because I know we'll hear about rents gonna, are going to go up. So is it fair to say we can reach a revenue neutral um, or cost and revenue neutral uh, time with this, but it, it seems to be about a five-year process? Thank you, and through you. So the best practice research does show that that's been able to be achieved in some of the municipalities that have been working on it for a period of time. Um, as I mentioned in my previous response to Councillor Stroud, uh, my team is building a costing model right now that would look at um, the specific process that um, a, um, a property owner would go, to, go through to obtain a license, and that includes all the steps that would involve staff. So whether there was you know, a simple process, whether it was a process we entered into because of an enforcement situation where someone hadn't obtained a license. So we're going through and building those scenarios now so we can understand in a very detailed way what the costing is associated with it. I think um, there's some buried costs in um, what it costs to, to be constantly dealing with enforcement issues that are ongoing and repeated. And I think what other municipalities have found that over time, um, programs like this have started to deal with that chronic, th that chronic need for enforcement um, you know, on a street by street, day to day basis. And it started to see some of that taper back and, and the resources really being put into that proactive um, approach to enforcement, which is what our municipality has embraced. It's very good news. Thanks very much. Okay, seeing no other questions, we will move on. Um, uh, number five, responsible pet ownership program status report. Councillor Sanic. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, through you, just some questions. So um, we heard our young delegate tonight uh, talk about her experience when DocuPet knocked on her door and um, and then, well, sorry, didn't knock on the door, but saw that they had a pet, left a hanger. A few weeks later, she got a letter from the city. So is it true that then we send our bylaw officers to those homes that get the letter to say that you're in violation of our um, pet licensing bylaw? Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you. So we have not um, proceeded with having enforcement staff um, approach individual homes that we have reason to believe there's an unlicensed pet. So that's a step that has not been implemented. Um, the door knocker system is was a way of trying to to urge people to go through and, and get the license. And, and I want to say that, um, and it may not be as clear in the report, but prior to moving forward with a door-to-door -door program, we employed a lot of other things. There's been a lot of community events. We've done social media programs. Uh, we've done the website. I've blogged about it. We have sent information packages out to the entire municipality, informing them about DocuPet, trying to educate people. And we are still seeing that there wasn't um, there wasn't the return on, on those outputs and, and trying to gently urge people into compliance, which is why this additional step was taken. But at this point, enforcement officers have not been going out door to door to, to follow up. Thank you, Anne. My second question 
is about um, what we learned about DocuPet going door to door. So um, it said that they don't go door to door beyond 530 and they don't actually knock on anyone's door. So going back to the bad guys that were pretending to be DocuPet people, um, if our residents, because I had one in my district, right? So if the residents do see someone going beyond 530 or actually knocking on the door, or trying to take money, sell them a tag at the door, what do they do? Do they call the police? Thank you, and through you, Mary Patterson. So definitely, if, if they're suspicious and, and you have an individual that's at your door that's not meeting with um, any of the, the process that was outlined tonight in, in terms of how that program's being administered, we certainly are encouraging people to call the police and also, you know, the next day to call our enforcement line or contact myself directly and uh, certainly provide us with the information so we can be doing our own follow-up and, and seeing if there's any patterns of behavior that we need to be aware of and then to be able to communicate out to the community Community, um, any key messaging related to that. Thank you. Councillor Ostroff. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. I am just um, wanted to comment on what I heard, and so um, with our speakers tonight on who, who so, experienced... Qu questions only. So, so you're in gonna the form sorry, you're yeah. gonna have to comment in a way that asks a question. Okay, stuff. good. Um, will will there be a, a review uh, on, based on the um, evidence or the testimony given, um, based on the issue of privacy? Can can we make sure that the citizens of Kingston uh, have are, are not being compromised through a, that program that seems more intent to be a business than it is to um, take care of our pets? Thank you, and through you. So certainly, um, since we've started to have some some resident concerns related to this program, the program was suspended. It still is suspended. Um, staff are doing a, a detailed review, and we'll continue to have structured conversations with DocuPet into the new year. And certainly, we'll be evaluating all of those considerations prior to proceeding with any reinstatement of the program or or perhaps a change of direction. Councillor Holland. Thank you, Your Worship. And through you, um, do staff have any concerns regarding the, the growing the business profit model um, that is related to compliance on our end, but also obviously um, in the final tally is, is something that reflects on a balance sheet for a private company? Are there any concerns regarding the what appears to be um, what has been presented as a highly successful program based on business growth, potential for jobs, et cetera. Uh, Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you. So what I can tell you um, is that the way that the program has been administered has been specifically what was presented to council and what we went out for in terms of an RFP. So um, from a staff perspective, we're more so, we're not philosophically questioning, you know, whether it's the right thing. We're just constantly monitoring whether or not we're administering the program as it was put out to tender, as per the contract that was established in the direction that was received from council. I think perhaps Commissioner Hurdle has a few other comments to add. Commissioner Hurdle. Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So this, this actually was also a recommendation that came through the resp Responsible Pet Ownership Program when it was implemented to have, um, it, it didn't specify DocuPet, but it did specify that we should have this kind of, of system in place and, and did promote also the increase in terms of compliance um, as far as uh, pet licensing. So. This, this is a follow-up in the uh, the RFP that was submitted. Uh, DocuPet responded, and that was brought to council, and uh, all the details were brought at that point in time to council as far as how the program would uh, would function. Uh, next on my list is Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes. Um, I, I've had a couple of calls from constituents, um, two, in fact, uh, that said, I have a house cat, declawed. She never leaves the house. I got a threatening letter. 
uh, like I said before, there's there's a really I got I received a very good reasonable information door knocker, but some of my constituents have shared with me the other one that uh, is not so uh, so con so nicely written. I would say so. Those constituents said, clearly, somebody must have looked in my window and seen a cat uh, and just gave me this threatening door knocker when, in fact, uh, do, I mean, I know that we say cats and dogs, full compliance, need to be licensed. What's the rationale for licensing a house cat that never leaves the house? Ms. Hagner? Thank you, and through you. So one of the, the primary reasons for doing it is that as a, a, a prior cat owner, um, and, and a cat owner that, um, that has had indoor cats, indoor cats sometimes crave going in the outdoors, and they'll do whatever they can to get out of the house. So in those cases, if that animal happens to get out of the house accidentally and is picked up um, as a stray that isn't identified, and um, it goes to the Humane Society because staff have no other way to identify that animal. Um, if the property owner or the, the cat owner isn't able to contact the Humane Society in a period of time, um, you know, sometimes that can lead to that cat being euthanized. And, and those are the scenarios that we're trying to prevent, certainly uh, for the loss of, of, the, of the pet, but also uh, that the municipality bears the cost associated with that because we, we supplement the funds to the Humane Society. So it's, you know, it's for the dual purpose that we really have a bylaw that asks for all pets to be licensed. Will there be... Uh, I, as I understand it, the renewal of, the, of this service will take place at the end of this, uh, not at the end of this calendar year, but at the end of this winter, is that right? And through you, Mary Patterson, so the current contract with DocuPet is up in December of 2018, so we have about one calendar year from now until that three-year contract is up. Would your expectation be, because I, I agree there's some genuine concerns about, about privacy, there's some concerns about uh, some, whether some of the messaging has been tactful or not. Uh, clearly, it stirred up a hornet's nest in the city. Um, do you anticipate... Will, will this go out to tender and will 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 we be asking for whatever company uh, provides this service that they address some of those concerns that we've heard here tonight and that my colleagues have brought forward Commissioner hurdle Thank you, and uh, through you, Mr. Mayor. So <clears throat> a couple of things. Uh, first of all, when we issued the RFP a couple of years ago, DocuPet was the only uh, company that submitted. So I, I'm not sure that it's a very common product out there, or many companies offer that service. It is possible. I don't know. Um, I do know that having an online service that could not only provide uh, the ability to register, but the ability to have a lost and found uh, pet was something that was identified in the Responsible Pet Ownership uh, Program, as well as a reward program, which Councillor Osanic uh, talked about. Um, those are all things, I think, that are, are in place. So I think the, the first step or our first approach would be to try to address the issues or concerns that have been brought forward by some community members rather than saying the whole program is not good. I think there are many good things about the programs. We've heard about some of them tonight. So I think it's, it's first starting by addressing the issues that have been brought forward rather than just dismissing the program completely. And my final question, um, is, I, I just, I, I can't imagine a city staffer writing and putting out the door knocker that is threat, sounds like it's threatening to a constituent, uh, to a citizen. Are we able to uh, kind of work with DocuPent 
and look at the, the that kind of wording and try to to make it uh, a little more user friendly for our citizens. Second. Thank you, and through you. So certainly as part of um, the internal discussions that we're having right now in the review with DocuPet specifically related to that element of the program, um, we are reviewing what's currently out there in terms of communications, and, and certainly that it's been my experience that whenever we've provided feedback related to strategic communications, um, key messaging that DocuPet has been quite receptive to receiving that feedback, and I would anticipate that will continue on a go-forward basis. Thank you. Councillor Hutchison. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd like to get this, um, something clarified about this. It seemed to me that DocuPet acknowledged that they were gathering a database and that they might be sharing that database with third parties. Is that, first part of my question, is that the case? And do we... Uh, does the city acknowledge that that is happening, and is it the basis of their um, business plan? Ms. Hector? Thank you, and through you. So, no, it is it is not our understanding at all that the information that's being collected on behalf of the municipality um, in which is data that is in the ownership of the municipality returns to the municipality upon um, any conclusion of the contract with DocuPet that any of that is being sold for third party pro processes or pro um, programs or anything of that nature, no. So when DocuPet gathers the information, they do they turn it over to the city and then the city processes it? Or do they hold their own database? <coughs> Through you, so as part of um, the software and everything that was developed custom for the city of Kingston, all of the data is stored um, within a DocuPet facility that's protected behind a, a firewall. So it's all maintained specifically um, with the highest regard for the protection of, of personal information and to ensure also that everything that's being done is being done in compliance with provincial and federal regulation as it relates to public information. So it's not being housed within the city of Kingston. My point is that if we ever decided to not proceed with having DocuPet as, um, as the pet licensor for the city of Kingston, any data that was collected through their system during that time gets returned to the municipality and it, and it becomes our like sole propriety, proprietor information. Okay, thank you. Councillor Candon. Thank you, and through you. Do we have, just in relation to the comments made by the uh, uh, delegation there, they, they um, it sounded as though we were doing something that was maybe a little out of line of like um, best practices. So any government institution that allows anyone to register anything, is there a best practice that, that is used where uh, people gather people's information or enforce bylaws or stuff like that where uh, there's a best practice because um, is there other precedents that we can use where third parties uh, private enterprises are, are doing similar things like this or is this uh, unique to this specific uh, uh, space a second uh, thank you and through you so the best example that I can provide that I would have knowledge of would be related to DocuPets um, operations in other municipalities. So they are offering the same service in a number of other municipalities within Ontario. Um, and I think some, uh, they're trying to expand to other areas of Canada. And I believe they're also working on um, some more, you know, multinational um, contracts as well, trying to, uh, to get into c some cities in the United States. I believe there may be some similar services um, or companies that have been established in the United States, as far as I'm aware. Um, they're very unique Canadian can uh, company in that respect, but um, in terms of other best practice examples related to uh, municipalities hiring third parties, I don't have any other examples off the top of my head, but if that's something that interests council, you know, certainly we can, we can do some research and report back. And just for clarification, how many cities is it right now? Do we know? It's 21. 31. 21 Canadian. Yeah. I believe it's 21. Okay. Councillor McLaren. 
thank you. How long is our contract with them? Like, um, we can negotiate, renegotiate a contract at any time with them? Like, they're being contracted out essentially to provide a particular service. Is that correct? Uh, yes, that's correct. So as part of the contract that the city entered into them, it was for a three-year period, and that is up in uh, December of 2018. Okay. So I was wondering if you could take some of the following concerns that I see from a, like, a philosophical basis, is that we have um, a company that is supposed to provide value for value, but we have a government that is supposed to um, at ultimately use force to get its way. And when you mix the two of them, this creates like a, a monstrous kind of hybrid in which you have um, force being used for private, pro pri private benefit. So and quite that's, question? the question is, question. could this kind of concern be taken into consideration when redesigning or recalling or recontracting this particular contract? Second. Um, I think certainly that all of the feedback from members of council is something that staff would, would strongly take under advisement when we're looking at, um, at the service on a go-forward basis. I mean, certainly as a municipality, we've, we've put effort and time in working with DocuPed into customizing a system that was built specifically for Kingston. Um, do we have the ability to replicate an online system? We do. We've built one through planning and development, and we're also doing one for building services. So could we do that with um, a licensing program as well? It is something that, that we could look at doing into the future. It does take time and, and resources. And as Commissioner Hurdle mentioned, um, there are some unique elements of the DocuPet platform that um, um, that we couldn't necessarily configure with the, the software that we have available to us, but certainly um, staff are willing to take any feedback as it relates to the performance of the program so that we can take that into consideration and in any recommendations that come back to council. Okay, uh, moving on to number six, siting of cannabis retail operation in Kingston. Number seven, Ontario Municipal Board decision applications for official plan and zoning bylaw amendment, project site one, 495 Princess Street, file numbers D0917-2014 and D1475-2014, project site two, 333 University Avenue, file numbers D0917-2014 and D1476-2014. Okay, we have no information reports from members of council. Uh, miscellaneous, oh, I'm sorry. So you want, to, oh, okay, declare a, a conflict with respect to information report number seven. So noted, thank you. Okay, no information reports from members of council. Uh, miscellaneous business, uh, that the following councillors be appointed to serve as Deputy Mayor, January and February, Councillor Bohm, March and April, Councillor Neal, May and June, Councillor Holland, July and August, Councillor Turner, September and October, Councillor Candon, and November, Councillor Shell. Can I have a mover, please? Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Turner. Please vote. And that carries. Okay, on to new motions. We have one new motion, moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Deputy Mayor Neal. Whereas Reddendale is not included in the terms of reference for the Central City Growth and Infill Strategy, and whereas there is a general recognition of infill development pressure that is unique in Reddendale, and whereas an organized group has been actively working toward control of infill development in Redendale for several years, and whereas the city has already engaged WSP Engineering Consulting Services to complete stormwater evaluations in Redendale and acknowledgement of stormwater neighborhood issues which may be related to infill development, and whereas WSP Engineering Consulting Services has a familiarity with the neighborhood, and whereas the residents have petitioned the city to have a planning framework to address their specific neighborhood pressures and needs, Therefore, be it resolved that staff be asked to advise council on the feasibility of developing a planning framework that is specific to address pressures in the Reddendale area to ensure that infill development is context appropriate and compatible with the physical character of the existing built form, including information from WSP Engineering Consulting Services as part of an additional scope of work within the comprehensive zoning bylaw consolidation project currently underway, and that council direct staff to report back uh, in January 2018 to present their findings based on sound planning principles 
and include an estimate of the cost of adding the scope of work for the Reddendale area to the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw Consolidation Project, and an approximation of the time frame under consideration, including community engagement. Councillor Turner, you have the floor. Thank you, and through you, Mayor Patterson. I'd like to thank the delegations that have come out this evening, and I'd like to thank you for your patience this evening for our long meeting. Um, we have been experiencing a lot of uh, problems within the uh, district, uh, traffic, infill, as we've heard tonight, as well as drainage. WSP is uh, addressing the stormwater drainage issues, and it's sort of all linked together with this issue, and I think they've done a great job at elaborating this evening, discussing the issues that are that are facing them, as well as showing a lot of good pictures of the heights of the various buildings. They, they do want development, as they've said, but they would like us to look at a framework within the development. Um, we've had various meetings at Center 70 to address the concerns, and staff has been very helpful. In terms of our toolbox as to what we can offer them, this is a good, good start for a framework. But I would like to ask staff about the interim bylaw control. Now, I'm not a big fan of this. It is taking a sledgehammer to it. But in terms of transparency, I just thought it would be a good idea that we can show transparency to all the viewers and all the people and explain the pros and cons of it very quickly, an overview. I believe Paige uh, has prepared some information on this. If you could address this quickly. Ms. Agnew. Thank you, and through you. Um, so an interim control bylaw is a tool that's available to municipalities under the Planning Act. Um, what specifically that tool is able to do is provide municipalities with the ability to pass a bylaw that is related to a certain geographic area of the city um, that allows you to freeze development of all types for a period of a year. There's a, um, an ability under the planning legislation to extend that to up to two years in time with rationale. And in order to to enact an interim control bylaw, there has to be a very sound planning argument for, for the use of that tool since it is such a strong tool. Um, there are appeal rights and there are, um, that can be available to people in the community if they're unhappy with council passing an interim control bylaw. The government is currently considering legislative changes to remove those appeal rights. It hasn't fully gone through yet, but that's part of some of the amendments that are being considered right now, provincially. Um, in terms of the benefits of it is, is, is what it does is it, it basically freezes things for a period of time so that there's no more physical change in an area while you're doing the study. So the study is a key component of meeting the criteria under the legislation and saying I've identified there's a major planning problem, I can substantiate that and in order to remedy, remedy that as a municipality we want to put a freeze on all development for a period of time of up to two years while we do the land use study and then you go through, you do the land use study and then at the end of that there's likely policy recommendations that the municipality could enact to help better guide development in that area. So it is a very strong tool. Um, it's something that um, staff would need some time to look at preparing um, what could feasibly be a defendable planning argument for use of a tool like an interim control bylaw. Um, it does have some drawbacks or unintended consequences depending on how it's scoped and that um, if there are people in an area that have planned or saved to do renovations or changes or made investments um, for their family, those things get caught up. It, it doesn't discriminate um, by person or by property owner. It really just looks specifically at the use. So you have to use the tool wisely and smartly in order to um, avoid any type of um, accusations of discrimination and there's very strong pieces of legislation on Ontario that um, do not allow any type of discrimination as it relates to land use planning by the type of person that lives in a unit. It really just looks at the unit and the use itself. So the, that's kind of a general overview. If you have any other questions related to it, I'm happy to try and explain. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate your explanation, and I, I do think it's it's more of a sledgehammer. I'm very happy with this motion that uh, I brought before council this evening. I think it's very clear and explains a lot of the information that we're looking for in terms of a framework to describe the neighborhood and how to address some of the issues. Um, I hope that the council will support it this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Deputy Mayor Neal. Yes, thank you. I was happy to second this motion. Um, I think it's it's a good motion that addresses 
uh, neighborhood concern. And I want to thank both the mover and staff for working collaboratively on on getting this motion right. Um, I do, I, I know a lot of the concern expressed has to do with basement flooding and and some of those issues. I was wondering if uh, Commissioner Keach could introduce or, or explain our uh, program uh, that the city has across the city to address basement flooding and to assist the community in, in addressing those concerns. Mr. Keach. Um, through your worship, so if the, uh, if the question is the citywide program um, that Utilities Kingston has to assist uh, residents. Um, so I think I talked a little bit about that at budget time. It's, I think we call it our flood prevention program. Um, it is available to residents who um, get uh, water and sewer services from uh, Utilities Kingston. We have in-house experts that uh, if you call, will come in, uh, take a look at your premises. There are a number of things that we are uh, particularly looking at. Um, one is uh, the feasibility of a backflow prevention device to be installed uh, in your residence, so that would prevent sewage from flowing back uh, back into basements. Um, we also look at uh, sump pumps, if there are currently sump pumps correctly installed, or if there is a need for a sump pump. Um, the other thing, roof leaders, uh, uh, again, to make sure that uh, they drain properly, drain away, uh, away from uh, building foundations as opposed to in foundations. And uh, on occasion also, um, and, and this, this this involves a bit more work and a bit more intrusive, but um, the, uh, the tile drains uh, around foundations uh, because we do find in occasion uh, that uh, um, they are installed in, improperly. I'll, I'll just leave it at that and not go into detail. So I, I think a fairly wide variety of things that is available. So we have the expertise to come in and look at that. We also have a fairly significant subsidy program to assist homeowners in any of the areas that I've talked about. And uh, what's the cap on the amount of uh, subsidy that the city makes available? I want to say 750, but I may be wrong. I, I'm, it's, it's fairly significant. I'm going to be guessing if I, um, if, if I answer that. Um, you know, we, we can provide that information, but it, but it is fairly significant, and it, it's a percentage, and I, I believe we pay 75%. The homeowner pays 25%, and it's different for all of the different things that I talked about, so some pumps, um, drains, uh, backflow preventers. And I believe there's a really good pamphlet that explains or information perhaps through the district councillor and through the Reddendale Association, you could make that literature available to them? So, so yes, um, that's available. It's available on our website. Um, we have uh, had uh, some meetings with um, some of the residents of impacted in the area to provide such information. I believe there is another meeting actually scheduled in the, in the future to, uh, to follow up on that as well. All my best ideas you've already thought of, so thank you very much. Okay, uh, Councillor Stroud. Thank you, Your Worship, and thank you, Councillor Turner, for this motion. Um, first, to comment, uh, both through the conversation I had with Ms. Robin before this motion was written, uh, when she was kind enough to call me and ask me for advice, and also uh, from the presentations we saw tonight, I, I think we can be pretty proud of how well some of our citizens understand planning issues. Uh, in the city. Uh, I, I don't think all municipalities could uh, could boast that kind of knowledge and I, I think we can all collectively are all learning uh, as well so uh, that, that's a really good thing. So to the question of whether Redendale has an infill uh, pressure problem and I think uh, we've seen evidence tonight from the presentations and uh, I think the answer to that is yes and is this proposed, uh, these steps that are in the resolve clause, do they address this problem? I think they do. And uh, there's synergies here with the uh, engineering firm that's already engaged in work for the city, and uh, therefore some efficiencies very likely can be found because of that synergy. So that's a good part as well. All in all, I'm happy to uh, support this uh, motion, although it doesn't affect my residents directly, 
Uh, I think it's the right thing to do if we're going to look at um, new guidelines and rules for the central Kingston area. It's, uh, we also need to have a look at the other areas of the city, maybe, maybe not in the center area, that also have similar development pressures. I think it's very significant here that although the pressure is similar in Redendale as in Sydenham, which I represent, the from the pictures and from the form of the uh, developments that are being uh, shown, as you recall in Sydenham, I, I spoke about so-called monster additions, monster homes. Well, uh, those were are exclusively in my district for rental accommodation for post-secondary students. That's not the case in Redendale. It appears from the photos and from the presentations. So, although the uh, the final uh, occupants of the of the infill. Uh, differ greatly between the districts. The overall problem is the same. It's a planning problem, and uh, I, uh, I'd like to support this and hope that staff can come up with some proactive solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shell. Thank you, Mayor Patterson. Um, I'm, I'm a little confused um, by the motion, but so I'll just ask it in the sense, is staff um, sort of figuring that this is a two-part motion, that part of it has to do with literally engineering and stormwater management and then there is a second part that so I presume the first really engineering can handle and will be handling anyway without a motion like this because there is a specific water problem stormwater problem um, in the area and and that really what staff are being directed to do more is to do with the planning issue um, the second Thank you, and through you, so the, the WSP study that's mentioned in the motion, that study is already underway. Engineering has been working on that and has had some initial um, consultation with the community to try to get a sense of, of the concerns and where the, the pressing issues are. Um, the reference to it is, is just to ensure that Council understands that we'll be using that information um, as a key guiding document in the way that we're developing planning scenarios and strategies for the area so that they're really interrelated issues um, and and like you've mentioned there's there are some challenges in this neighborhood that are different than what we're dealing with in the city central so it really uh, requires a customized approach to make sure that we're effectively dealing with the pressures that are there um, so staff will be coming back if council supports this motion um, in January with a scope of work to deal with the planning piece um, and some associated resourcing to support that the the engineering piece is, is already underway uh, thank you yes um, I will be uh, supporting the motion with the understanding that we have been receiving emails from uh, other people who, who aren't as, uh, as keen because it does affect property values, um, depending on how this, this all goes. But it's certainly worth having staff look at. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else that wishes to speak? Councillor George. Thank you, Your Worship, and through you. Um, first of all, I'm going to support the motion. I think it's it's a good idea. I have a number of friends that reside in Redendale. Um, I lived in that area for while well, in uh, Henderson Place for a number of years. But um, just two things I'm a little concerned with uh, that I just want to get out there, and I think it's for the presenters that uh, are still here this evening, um, is that staff will probably be entertaining some applications over the period of time that it's going to take to get this resolved and get some answers through this, which could be 12 to 18 months. I think historically we find it's, it's time consuming to do this. Um, but I guess one of, one of the things I'm concerned with is uh, I've already heard from some, some residents, as I, Councillor Shell just alluded to, that uh, are not sitting on the same side as the residents we're hearing from this evening. And, and part of the concern is that uh, staff may look at the applications a little differently because some of the, the things that have already been mentioned, but I think they have been dealt with, I knew through, through the commissioner's office has to do with, um, well, there's this motion coming for count before council on Tuesday night, we may look at your application differently and such. But I think there has to be an assurance that we're working under today's policies, so applications will be looked at uh, under today's regulations and processed as they normally would and presented in what we hope is going to be um, under 
the current zoning without any variances and such required because I think that's where we run into trouble is when they try to cram too much and you know and then they're looking for exceptions to the rules which I think you know if we can follow the rules it may not be as as bad um, but the uh, sort of tov dovetailing onto that is um, I guess I'm a little concerned if there are applications that come through the process between now and the time we, we I think it'll be a future council that may actually deal with a new policy if that's what's going to happen here. Um, that there may be OMB uh, appeals uh, happening and I, I'm just a little concerned because I think residents have to know that on the average it runs us about a $50,000 price tag to defend a decision of city staff if it complies with zoning and OP. Um, and that's a, that's a cost that's incurred by the taxpayer. And I think people need to know that there is that cost associated to all taxpayers of the city. And that um, I think we have to look at each of the applications as they come through on their merit and make sure that in fact they are complying with the zoning and such and that uh, appeals aren't wasted. Uh, so I, basically, I guess that's just a comment I have, but I do support the initiative. I, I think it's long overdue, um, and I'm glad that engineering's already working uh, on this and have been for some time, and hopefully we can incorporate all this in and get it resolved and, uh, and move forward, because I know there are some people that are current homeowners there that may be not a party to this and have you know, things they want to do for future investment and this type of thing in that neighborhood and they're kind of relying on the ability to do things with their property that may be something they're going to be using for for retirement in the future. So um, I think we have to be very careful on how we deal with this uh, process. So just my comments, but I am going to support the motion. I think it's long overdue and I look forward to a resolve. Thank you. Is there anybody else who wishes to speak? Okay, so we will call the vote on new motion number one. And that carries. Are there any notices of motion? Seeing now, Mr. Clerk, I'll ask for minutes, please. Moved by Councillor McLaren, seconded by Councillor Hutchison, that the minutes of City Council meeting number 2018-1, held Tuesday, December 5th, 2017, be confirmed. Okay, we will call the vote on new mo on the minutes. I'm mistaken. And that carries. Uh, we have some tabling of documents, number of communications. Is there any other business? Maybe I'll just take a moment to uh, wish everybody a very Merry Christmas and safe and happy holidays, happy new year. And certainly I look forward to seeing everybody at the New Year's levy, January the 1st from two to four, just down the hall, Memorial Hall. And certainly uh, hope as many people as possible across the community are able to join us for that. So with that, Madam Deputy Clerk will ask for bylaws, please. Uh, we do have a fair number of bylaw votes tonight. Um, I would uh, remind Council that with the approval of the deferred motion uh, as amended, that there has been, a, you consented to add a bylaw to uh, amend the committee bylaw, and that has been included as bylaw number 15. Uh, Councillor Bohm, you are excused for the first six bylaw votes. Okay. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Sanek, that bylaws 9 and 10 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. Okay. 
And that carries. Moved by Councillor Turner, seconded by Councillor Osanek, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaws 9 and 10 three readings. Please vote. That carries. Um, point of order. Point of I order. don't think we can do those two because Councillor Turner is showing us absent and she was the mover. Uh, Through you, Mayor that Patterson, that, that's correct. Um, uh, we will uh, have the mover be Councillor Osanek and okay. uh, Councillor McLaren can be the seconder. Sharp eyes, Councillor Osanek, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so uh, bylaw vote C, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaws 9 and 10 be given their third reading. Please vote. That carries. Moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaw 11 be given its first and second reading. Excuse me, before we read bylaw 11, uh, Councillors Candon, Hutchison, and Deputy Mayor Neal are also excused for the next three votes. Councillor Candon. Councillor Candon, can you sign out, please? Okay. Bylaw vote D, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaw 11 be given its first and second reading. Please vote. That carries. By law vote E, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 11 three readings. Please vote. That carries. Bylaw vote F, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaw 11 be given its third reading. Please vote. Councillor Candon, you remain excused for the next three bylaw votes. Councillors Boehm, Hutchison, and Deputy Mayor Neal may return. Deputy Mayor Neal. Bylaw vote G, moved by Councillor Osanek, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaw 12 be given its first and second reading. Please vote.
That carries. Bylaw vote H, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving Bylaw 12 three readings. Please vote. That carries. Bylaw vote I, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Bylaw 12 be given its third reading. Please vote. That carries. Councillor Candon, you can return, please. Bylaw vote J, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaws 1 through 8 and 13 through 15 be given their first and second reading. Please vote. <coughs> that carries. Bylaw vote K, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that Clause 11.34 of Bylaw Number 2010-1 be suspended for the purpose of giving bylaws 3 through 6 and 8 three readings. 8 and 15, sorry, 8 and 13 through 15. Please vote. That carries. And finally, moved by Councillor Osanic, seconded by Councillor McLaren, that bylaws 3 through 8 and 13 through 15 be given their third reading. Please vote. Please vote. Motion to adjourn. Moved by Councillor Bohm, seconded by Councillor Turner. Please vote. And we are adjourned. Thank you very much.